big true crime tale today, a serial killer double feature. Two men who very possibly killed separately, one for sure did, and then they joined forces to kill in all likelihood at least 25 people, and probably quite a few more than that in Central and Northern California in the early and mid-1980s. Leonard Lake was a former Marine obsessed with preparing for a nuclear apocalypse, taking nude photos of as many women as possible, having sex with as many of those women as possible, and pursuing what he called Operation Miranda, a sick plan based on the novel The Collector that involved kidnapping young women to imprison and train to be his sex slaves. Lake was obsessed with building a bunker to both imprison these women and also hopefully survive the apocalypse he believed was about to happen any day so that he could then continue to sexually imprison women to be sex slaves after society collapsed. Leonard Lake was a complete and total psychopath, and his murder buddy, Charles Ng, was arguably scarier than he was. Charles Ng was an immigrant from Hong Kong who was really good at coming up with paperwork to create new identities for himself, good enough to join the Marines less than a year after making it to the U.S. Like Lake, he would also become obsessed with apocalyptic survivalism, and he'd be arrested for trying to steal and smuggle military weapons, then escape and meet up with Lake, who he'd met through another man interested in survivalism. And then when Ng wasn't behind bars, he would help Lake with Operation Miranda and in all likelihood also kill and rape and torture a lot of other people. These are two very, very scary dudes. Two men trained in how to use military weapons, weapons uh, they had large stockpiles of. They weren't afraid to use them on anyone who got in their way, anyone who tried to shut down Operation Miranda. And now one of these men is dead and one is behind bars in a California prison. Find out who lives, find out who died, Learn about all the crazy shit that led up to their arrests in a how is this story not way more well-known, fascinating true crime edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. Hope life is well in whatever facet of the multiverse you're living in today. I'm doing well in this one. I'm Dan Cummins, the master sucker, the mushmouth king, Lucifina's plaything in a ton of universes, and just a regular dude doing the best he can to understand something new every week in this one. I'm feeling better this week. I feel a little, uh, you know, a uh, little, little less unhinged than I felt the past few weeks. Our new normal had me all shook up, but I feel, uh, I feel recalibrated. Got my head back down, focused on work and family, ready to plow ahead again. Uh, hail Nimrod, give me strength. Hail Lucifina, give me fun. Praise Bojangles, give me courage, and Triple M, keep me silly, you yacht rock demigod. Uh, thanks for the good feedback on the new stand-up special, Get Out of Here, Devil, out on Google Play, Amazon, uh, you know, Amazon Prime, Sp- uh, Spotify, iTunes, Pandora, and more. Thanks for the ratings and reviews across various platforms. Uh, greatly appreciated. I've checked them out. Uh, make me feel good to know that a lot of you like it. Um, very cool knowledge and truth tea in the store today at badmagicmerch.com. Gotten so many compliments on the store and on the merch recently. Feels great. Thank you, Logan and Kate at Spicy Club, for running our store, giving us uh, the sickest shit, I think, in the whole podcast game. And now we have uh, Time Suck phone cases at the store as well. 13 different phone models to choose from, hard cases with rubber plates. Logan has one on his iPhone now, and it looks real good. Variety of color options. Quick reminder that we gave $5,400 to the Penn Fed Foundation this month. Thank you, Space Lizards. Penn Fed, first national veteran service organization to launch its COVID-19 relief program for emergency, emergency, there we go, financial assistance in March. The mission of the Penn Fed Foundation for Military Heroes is to empower military service members, veterans in their communities with the skills and resources to realize financial stability and opportunity. They help uh, veterans buy homes, go to school, help them pay their bills when times get tough. Go to penfedfoundation.org to find out more or just link on over in the episode description. Now for another crazy-ass tale. A tale of two men, both twisted and horrible on their own, who found each other and together brought even more pain to a lot of innocent people who ended up in their crosshairs in Central and Northern California. True Crime Sucks starts now. Yeah, yeah, yeah! We don't often end up knowing exactly why certain people do certain terrible things. They either refuse to admit guilt or speak to their motives once they've been caught or, or they do choose to speak to their motives but obviously lie to try and make themselves look better than they are or maybe inflict further pain on society. With one of today's two serial killers, we know exactly why he did what he did. He put a very candid confession you'll hear later uh, regarding his motives uh, on tape that investigators found a confession that lines up perfectly 
with what he confessed to other people and what investigators know he did. Leonard Lake didn't care about the wants and desires of almost any other person on earth. He didn't care about his victims' feelings or, uh, you know, needs, about their, about their safety, obviously. He wanted a sex slave, pure and simple. He was, you know, arguably a sex addict who didn't have a problem finding women to sleep with, but he, he wanted more than that. He wanted a woman who would sleep with him, who he didn't have to pay to sleep with him, who also didn't have any other expectations from him. You know, he wanted uh, uh, someone to have sex with him when he wanted, how he wanted it, and then he wanted them just to leave him the hell alone right afterwards. Like Bob Berdella, the Kansas City butcher from a few weeks ago, heavily influenced by the collector. He loved the book that, uh, that the movie Bob Watch was based on, a book about a man who kidnaps a woman, makes her live as his captain in the hopes that she will fall in love with him, except Lake didn't need her to fall in love with him. He just wanted to have a woman who didn't try to escape and understood it was in her best interest to satisfy his needs, you know, whatever those needs happened to be. And he also didn't want to work. Uh, work got in the way of his sexual desires. He'd rather kill people, steal their money, sell their belongings, and do things like collect their disability checks so they could continue to provide him with money after their deaths so he could not work and stay focused on Operation Miranda. Right, kidnapping women, keeping them as sex slaves. The name Miranda coming from the collector, that's the name of the female protagonist in that novel and movie. Lake was evil. He knew he was evil. He didn't care. He only cared about pursuing his desires. The cost to others didn't bother him a bit. And he enjoyed bringing Charles Ng along for the ride. As bad as Lake was, I think Ng was probably worse. Maybe Ng made Lake feel better about himself. You know, if Lake was bad, at least he wasn't as bad as his buddy Charlie. So let's get to know these two pieces of shit. Let's find out what they did and glean further insight into what may have made them tick in a big old time slug timeline that will co cover both from the time of their births to the death of one and the incarceration of the other. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. On October 29th, 1945, in San Francisco's St. Francis Hospital, Leonard Thomas Lake was born to Gloria Lake, age not listed in any sources, and 21-year-old U.S. Navy sailor Elgin Lake. And little Leonard was not born to a happy couple. Elgin and Gloria argued constantly. Elgin was an alcoholic who constantly got drunk. Still, they stayed married long enough for Leonard to have a little sister, Sylvia, born in 1950, and a little brother, Donald, born in 1951. And everything was great after that. When a couple with one child can't stand each other, uh, the best thing to do all the time is to have more kids, obviously. Uh, that always fixes everything. I know shortly after Donald was born, Elgin bounced. He left his wife and kids, moved to Seattle in 1951 to start a new life and not pay child support. So he was an awesome dude. Leonard clearly had a great role model for a biological father. It's crazy that he turned out the way he did. Abandoned with three small children, Gloria barely managed to scrape by for the next several months, living in some cheap public housing, constantly worried about how she was going to survive. And she reached out to Elgin to repair the marriage. They agreed to have her and two of the three kids come up and live with him in Seattle. Not all the kids, just two thirds of them. They continue to make awesome decisions. Leonard had started kindergarten and Gloria decided she didn't want to interrupt the beginning of his education, which is stupid. Seriously, fuck kindergarten. No parent should ever worry about uprooting their kid's social life when the kid is in kindergarten because it's fucking kindergarten. I went to three different grade schools in two different states between kindergarten and third grade. No part of me has ever felt sad that I didn't get to remain close with my old kindergarten buddies. Oh, my old coloring buddies, my old kindergarten friends, because I don't, I don't remember them. I may have been friends with a kid named Steve. Not even 100% for sure on that. Maybe. maybe. We may have, uh, I don't know, ridden our bikes once or something. Glory decided to leave her first son in San Francisco to stay with her parents while she and her, you know, and his two siblings, her other two kids, headed north. Cue future abandonment issues. According to her vague recollection of the event years later, Glory had asked Leonard if he wanted to go with her to Seattle, and he said he didn't. Also stupid. You don't give kindergartners choices like that because their little brains aren't ready to make them. You don't ask them if they want to stay or if they want to go. You just tell them, great news. We're going to Seattle to see daddy. Yay. And then odds are they get excited because you're excited. You know, little kids are easy to trick because their brains aren't very developed. At the train station, Leonard changes his mind because he's a little kid. He doesn't know how shit works. He realizes what's happening and he tearfully begs not to be left behind. And it was too late. Gloria had reserved space only for herself and Sylvia, planning to carry the infant Donald in her arms. If only she could have rescheduled. If only that was possible. No, she doesn't. Leonard pleads hysterically sobbing and screaming, clinging to his mom's skirt. She leaves anyway. He stays behind with his grandparents. Many think this permanently emotionally scarred Leonard. I bet it did. Leonard would never again live with either of his parents, even though his mother and siblings would return to San Francisco within the year. 
and Leonard would never fully forgive his mom for being abandoned. For the next several years, Gloria and Leonard's little brother and sister struggle and live in poverty while Leonard continues to live in the more stable home of his grandparents. How strange. To be separate like that from your siblings and, and mother, maybe even more strange because they live in the same city, it would be so easy right, to live with them, but you don't. While his siblings struggled, sometimes uh, you know, with uh, not getting enough to eat, sometimes wearing thrift store clothes, sharing a room, Leonard has his own room, plenty of food, new fashionable clothes. He's living with grandma mom and grandpa dad and in the middle-class Glen Park neighborhood of San Francisco. And while I would think this arrangement would tend to create resentment of Leonard from his brother and sister, you know, living with less than he had, it actually went the opposite way in the situation. And Leonard would end up looking down on his other siblings for, for being poor, looked down on his mom for being poor. In June 1956, Gloria remarries. And a 10-year-old Leonard now has a stepdad, kind of. He never lived in this guy's home. His grandparents were in charge of him, so he never really developed a relationship with the guy who's uh, never named in any of the sources, only given the briefest of mentions in his biography. His mom and new guy, uh, you know, went to uh, have two children together, two girls, Janet and Patty. Now Leonard has two half-sisters, uh, only one of which he'll have a real relationship with. While Leonard's four siblings, three sisters and, and brother Donnie, struggle in poverty, he goes to summer camps full of mountain hikes and takes swim lessons and lives a nice middle-class life. In 1960, when Leonard is 14 and his younger brother Donnie is nine, Donnie is struck by a train, suffers a massive head injury that leaves him with permanent brain damage, and Leonard will never forgive him for it. Seriously. His little brother suffers a massive head wound, and Leonard's emotional reaction is, Fuck Donnie! Wish that train would have just killed that kid! Mommy always loved him more than me! 14-year-old Leonard, who already wasn't close with Donnie, despises his brother for having a disability for the rest of Donnie's life. According to half-sister Janet, Leonard just had no use for incompetent people. He looked down on anyone who collected welfare, people like his mom, anyone who he felt wasn't contributing to society enough. He talked often about how people who just took from the system should be punished. As Janet would later recall, Leonard once said that if he could poison the water supply of everyone on welfare, he would gladly do so. And based on what he'd do later in life, I don't think he was talking shit here. Lake regarded Donnie as a welfare cheater because he collected social security disability payments. Leonard allegedly said of his brother, he's a leech. He'd be better off dead. Strange statements from a guy who would later kill and steal instead of having to work. Leonard's cousin Chester, nine years younger than Leonard, would also later recall uh, Leonard despising Donnie, as uh, you know, would many other people when news of Leonard's murders broke years later. Chester would also later recall some animal cruelty in Leonard's childhood, something that seems to come up quite a bit in serial killer biographies. He said he'd come visit Leonard when he was eight, and Leonard were, toward, uh, Leonard were towards the end of high school, and he remembered Leonard having a chemistry lab where he would use acid to dissolve various materials. Chester remembered being fascinated with the hordes of mice Leonard collected. He said Leonard just had a few initially, but they kept just you know reproducing, as mice do, over and over again, and he ended up with too many to count. He had a little world of mice, and he was their god. And initially... He was a good God. Leonard built a little city for his mice children, a whole mice world, you know, mouse world full of tunnels, castles, mazes, even a little train for them to ride on. Took up most of his room. Sounds pretty cool, actually. And eventually he no longer wanted to live in a room full of mice. The mouse God grew angry and he decided to smite and destroy his furry little children. He used the acid from his chemistry set to completely dissolve their dead bodies. He would use the acid to burn them alive. And unlike a fair amount of kids who engage in animal cruelty and then almost immediately regret it and feel horrible, burning up those mice didn't bother little Leonard one bit. The most disturbing thing I came across regarding Leonard's childhood are rumors that either Leonard's mom or his grandma mom encouraged him to take nude photos of his little sisters when he was uh, growing up. No age comes up, but this is mentioned in several articles and in at least one book. Supposedly, this was done under the guise of teaching Leonard to not feel shame regarding the, the nude human body. And as crazy as that sounds, I, I mean, I, I can believe it, I guess. He grew up to become obsessed with taking nude pictures of women, like super obsessed, as you're going to find out. And he'd take nude pics of grown women and young girls alike when he was grown up. And this introduction to nude photography would have happened in the late 50s, early 60s in San Francisco when and where social norms were a lot more counterculture than they were in virtually every other place in the nation. If this rumor is true, then another rumor associated with these pictures may also be true that Leonard later used these pictures as blackmail against his younger siblings to coerce sexual favors out of them. 
And uh, while Lake never admitted to this and neither did uh, any family member, it would not surprise me one bit if this were true. Sex with the much younger first cousin did get brought up at the murder trial of his murder partner, Charles Ng, after his death. She admitted to having sex with him on the uh, witness stand and letting him take nude photos of her. First cousin isn't a sister, but it's getting close. His childhood is starting to feel like a uh, Steph Coxcurvy routine now. If your mama had five kids and only abandoned you, and you dissolved hundreds of mice in acid, and took nude pics of your sisters, and maybe blackmailed your sisters for sex, and definitely took nude pics of your cousin who you had sex with, you might be a killer. Uh, now let's take a break from exploring the childhood of one soon-to-be horrific piece of shit and travel across the Pacific to dig into the origin of his future murder partner, Charles Ng, born almost 15 years after Leonard in 1960, the same year Lake's little brother, Donnie, got struck by a train. December 24th, 1960, Christmas Eve, Charles Cheetah Ng is born. And at the moment of his birth, the devil himself gets the chills and thinks, what the fuck? Did I, did I just get scared? How? I'm the devil. What the hell is that about? Are, are those goosebumps? Charles is the third child and first son born in British Hong Kong to hardworking Japanese immigrant and camera salesman Kenneth Ng and his wife, Oi Ping. Charles would be the younger brother of oldest daughter Alice and middle child Betty. Kenneth came from nothing and fled Japan after it was ravaged in World War II, going from selling trinkets to American GIs on the streets to getting a sales job for Leica, a German camera company. He traveled for work to provide for his wife, three kids, his mom, his wife's mom, and two aunts. They all lived together in an apartment. As his children grew, Kenneth worked even harder to produce respectable living conditions for his family. He even ended up buying a car, which was a true luxury among Hong Kong residents at that time. Bought a piano so his kids could take lessons. The uh, the Ings were like the like the Hong Kong Jeffersons. They were moving on up. Uh, outings in the cars, picnics, good food became an important part of the Ing family routine. Early in his life, Charles discovered martial arts guru, movie star Bruce Lee, and he tried to copy the actor's moves for the next few decades to become a skilled martial artist. When his parents wouldn't allow him to have real martial arts weapons, such as a uh, uh, nunchaku. You know, nunchaku sticks, a.k.a. nunchucks. Young Charlie made his own. He packed tightly twisted paper into a pair of cardboard tubes from paper roll towel rolls and connected them with twine to make his little kid nunchucks. To harden his small fist, he filled a cloth sack with sand, attached it to a wall, and repeatedly punched it with all the strength he could muster. Uh, cute if I didn't know how murderous and sadistic this dude would be later become. From an early age, he wanted to dish out some pain. Uh, Charles' older sister, Betty, would later recall fond memories of Ing as related to her brother, uh, you know, or in life, home life, related to her brother, saying, Charles would always prepare snacks for me to come home to after school. Many hot and humid nights, he slept on the top level of the bunk bed and I below. He would fan me to sleep before himself. Right, so that's nice. With a soft giggle, she remembered Charlie's pet, a chicken, saying he always looked after his chicken very well, always feeding it with goodies like cheddar cheese. So I guess he had some good in him at some point. Uh, actually, he always would have. And that's one of the scariest aspects of human monsters. They can be so horrific to one person or to most people, but then be so kind to other people. Right? They'd be so much easier to spot, just to deal with psychologically if they were just full evil. Kenneth worked extra hard to give his children opportunities he never had. He was able to get all three kids you know, into private schools. He expected all three kids to honor his sacrifices by getting good grades. Alice and Betty did live up to his expectations. Charlie did not. When Charles brought home bad report cards, Kenneth punished him severely using a cane to beat him. Obviously, this would be viewed as blatant child abuse today. Uh, in Hong Kong in the 60s, a good old cane whooping was still somewhat within the range of normal parental punishment. Uh, kind of. After his son was found guilty of murders years later, Kenneth would admit to thinking he, uh, he had taken things too far with Charles. He said he would actually tie him down for the beatings so he couldn't escape his punishment. He said he beat him so severely that his wife, Oi Ping, would beg for him to stop, but he wouldn't stop because he was so angry that his son continually disappointed him. So maybe uh, dad was pretty uh, abusive, actually. Young Charles Ng reacted to this punishment by withdrawing. He interacted with few people, uh, mainly his sister Betty and a cousin Benny Chung were the, were the people he would interact with. Other traumatic events may have wounded him even more deeply than the cane beatings. His mom, Oi Ping, later recalled two such incidents. She said, Charlie loved pets. He used to have a chicken, which he raised from very small to over a pound. My mother thought the chicken was very smelly. She suggested to kill it. 
And when his pet chicken uh, was killed and wound up in a cooking pot, <laughs> it's pretty fucked up. Uh, Charles, you know, he burst into tears and retreated to his bedroom brokenhearted. Oi Ping also said, and then later on he had a turtle and he would not let us lock it up. So the turtle was all over the place in the house. Every day he would buy fish to feed the turtle. And then Oi Ping said that the, the thing smelled. He said it was, uh, she said it was very smelly. So we wanted to bring it to a pond very far away where Charlie could release it himself. And then the loss, and he has to do that, has to get rid of it. So the loss of his second pet, again, really, you know, stresses out young Charles. At least they didn't eat the turtle. But someone else may have, though. He probably knew that. In 1960s Hong Kong, uh, turtles were getting eaten fucking left and right. Good old turtle jelly. Powdered turtle shells and bellies boiled for 12 hours, mixed with herbs and lotions, served up as a type of jelly-like soup. Still popular. And then there was a time when he brought home a stray dog and his parents made him get rid of the dog. And they didn't eat the dog either, but again, someone else may have eaten it. I'm not even joking. Eating dogs was banned in Hong Kong in 1950, but older generations living there still ate the occasional dog in the 60s. So there is a chance. All three of his pets were eaten, which I do have to admit is extremely unfortunate. And now Charles Ng's young life is starting to feel like a Steph, Steph Cox scurvy joke. If your parents killed and ate one of your pets and made you get rid of two other pets that also may have been eaten. You might be a killer. Charles faced life without the companionship of any pets. With few friends, he spent hours in his room alone and reading. Early on, it also became apparent that Charles was nearsighted, which required him to wear strong, thick, corrective eyeglasses, which did not help him get more friends. Another thing that made of, uh, may have made it difficult for Charles to make friends was uh, the fact that he was a violent, sticky-fingered psychopath at a young age. In an article for Penthouse Magazine, journalist Rick Mafina revealed that Ng's family sought psychiatric treatment for Charles uh, by the time he was 10. After he stole a photograph from a friend's home, Mafina found out that young Charles liked to dish out beatings as well. He'd seek out Western children in parks to assault them. He'd hurl Molotov cocktails from rooftops. He tried to set various buildings on fire. He was arrested for trying to start a fire. At school, he got in trouble for writing uh, an obscene letter to a teacher about a bunch of you know, deviant sexual shit he wanted to do to her. And then when he lit a classroom on fire by mixing some chemicals, he was expelled at the age of 15. <laughs> if you wrote a note to your teacher about how you wanted to fuck her every which way but Sunday and beat up kids who look different than you and set a variety of fires in your neighborhood and got kicked out of school for setting your classroom on fire, you might be a killer. Uh, Ing's uncle Rufus, his dad's brother, had become a teacher in Preston, England, on the western coast, north of, north of Liverpool, and Charles' sister Betty moved in with him while attending an English school. And then in 1976, uh, Kenneth sent 16-year-old Charles to England as well to study at High Bentham Grammar School. During the week, Charles would live in a dorm. On the weekend, he'd live with his uncle. And uh, after just a few months, Charles wanted to come home, said his uncle didn't want him, and he was right. Uncle R Rufus wanted him out of his house. Why? Probably because he was still a psychopath. Uh, he was still stealing shit, causing problems. He stole 40 pounds from a classmate as an act of revenge for ignoring Charles while paying more attention to a different pal and a bunch of other petty crimes and probably a bunch of stuff that he was never caught for. Uh, still determined that his young son, Charlie, would receive an education, Kenneth Ng pushed him to get his high school diploma equivalent, which he did in Hong Kong in 1978 when he was 18. Now, let's jump back uh, to, to 1963, 15 years back, and cover... You know, uh, Charlie's future murder mentor, Leonard Lake, graduating high school, slowly, steadily becoming more and more of a piece of shit. And then we'll jump back to Charlie. 1963, while in high school, Leonard would read The Collector by John Fowles. John Fowles would actually testify about the book at Charles Ings, Charlie Ng's excuse me, murder trial many years later. We talked at length a few weeks ago about the 1965 movie of the same name based on this book, the Kansas City serial killer Bob Berdella, right? The, the Kansas City butcher became obsessed with. Quick refresher now, the book came out in 1963, and Leonard read it when he was 17 or 18. The plot follows a lonely, psychotic young man, Frederick Clegg, who kidnaps a woman named Miranda, young female art student he's attracted to in London, holds her captive in the cellar of his rural farmhouse. Frederick holds Miranda captive for over a month, thinking she'll eventually fall in love with him, want to please him. Instead, she gets sick and dies, and he buries her in the garden, and the book ends with him preparing to kidnap another girl, hoping that she will want to please him. And just like Barbara Della got really turned on by the thought of holding an attractive young woman hostage for a long period of time, so did Leonard. He started to masturbate to fantasies of a young woman he had trapped in his cell, a woman who would fulfill any sexual desire of his, a woman available for his sexual gratification anytime he wanted her, a woman 
completely under his control. And years later, he will devote his life to what he calls Operation Miranda. Yee. In the spring of 63, 17-year-old Leonard graduates from high school and then in January 20 or on January 27th, 1964, 3 months after turning 18, he enlists in the Marine Corps. And he adapts quickly to military life. He loves it. He learns how to use uh, chemicals in combat, how to conduct guerrilla warfare, how to use explosives. Marine Corps training gives Lake the opportunity to drive large and small vehicles, provides him with the instructions on how to expertly read maps. Field survival techniques lodge themselves in his memory for future use when he will define himself as a survivalist. He learns a lot of military jargon, and in the future, he'll refer to any project as an operation or ops. Projects like killing people. Projects like raping people. Just ops. Not, not being evil. Just, just knocking out some ops. Just knocking out a little ops here and there. Uh, he loves wearing camouflage. He'll wear it often for the rest of his life. After graduating from basic training, he enters, completes uh, specialized classes, becomes a radar technician. The Corps transfers him to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, where he takes advanced courses in aircraft radar work. Uh, and I do know North Carolina residents, by the way, that that is also pronounced Camp Lejeune. There's a whole fucking debate I learned about watching a local news YouTube video. On weekend passes and during leaves of absences, or leaves of absence, excuse me, Lake often visits relatives at the home of an uncle who lives in South Carolina. And at one of these gatherings in April 1965, Lake is pleasantly surprised when another guest shows up, Karen Lee Minersman, 18 years old, the daughter of his uncle's friend. She had traveled from Delaware, where she was going to college, where she was majoring in math. Homesickness motivated her decision to spend spring break with her parents and while home. She makes uh, one of the worst decisions of her life, and she meets Leonard Lake. As soon as they meet, both Karen and Leonard feel a certain attraction to one another. And before he returns to his Marine base, they agree to correspond by mail. Uh, Lake loved to write letters. Holy shit, did this dude love a letter. He liked a diary entry. Mostly he liked nude pics, but he also liked to uh, write letters and write in a diary. And because of that, we know way more about him than we know about a lot of serial killers. Leonard and Karen exchanged many affectionate letters during the following months until President Lyndon Jumbo Johnson, a former early suck subject, decided to send more Marines to Vietnam and Lake was one of those Marines. Leonard Lake arrived in Southeast Asia not long before Christmas, 1965, spent most of the following year, quote, in country. Then in late 1966, Lake was reassigned to duty in California at the Point Magoo Naval Air Station base uh, just uh, south of Oxnard, north of Malibu. Beautiful area. My God, is that area gorgeous. I've driven by this uh, Naval Air Station. I guess not base, technically, Naval Air Station. Uh, lots of gorgeous California girls, too, but Lake didn't care. He wanted a girl back east. 1968, Karen confided in Lake that she was lonely. She wrote that she didn't feel very worldly at the age of 20 and that she hoped to find, quote, someone to direct her. And then she thought Leonard might, quote, fill the bill. And Leonard responded by furiously beating off so many times. Then he wrote back something to the effect of, fuck yeah, bro, can do, can do. Karen wanted Lake to show her the ways of the world and that fed into his op Operation Miranda type fantasies. March 1969, Lake used his leave to seal the deal with Karen, flying to Delaware, directing her on how to do a variety of shit. This is how this fits in that hole. This is how it goes in this one. This is where you put your mouth when I stand here. You stand on your hands in that corner and face the window, and then I stand in front of you and do jumping jacks while you stick your tongue out. That kind of stuff. I'm not sure exactly what they did. Lake proposed marriage. Karen accepted. She accompanied him back to California. Before the month was over, they were married. Leonard was 25. She was 20. And for the first few months, things were great. And then shit got weird. This pattern will be repeated in a lot of Lake's uh, future relationships. Lake started to joke with his fellow Marines about selling Karen's body to them after a few months of marriage. She tried to laugh it off at first. Then she got the feeling that he was uh, he was serious because he, uh, he was serious. Lake constantly wanted her to wear uh, more revealing clothing. Kept pressuring her to try kinkier and kinkier stuff in bed. He started becoming more domineering, treating her not like a partner, but an object, a possession. Luckily for Karen, a little over a year into marriage, Lake left. He volunteered midway through 1970 for a second tour of duty in Vietnam, and Karen went to go live with his grandparents. In the green hell of Vietnam, later would later say he really enjoyed the experience. He also may have lied his ass off about his Vietnam experience. He'd boast of killing a lot of people when he got back and said that the toughest thing he had to do over there was zip up all the body bags, you know, all the people he killed. According to his records, he didn't see any action, like absolutely none, like not one firefight, nothing. He served as a radar technician stationed in Da Nang, where he repaired radar machinery and was never involved in any battles. He also lost his shit in Vietnam, literally and figuratively, becoming convinced that his wife, who was living with his grandparents again, was cheating on him all the time. She wasn't. He got so worked up thinking about it, he saw a military mental health expert who diagnosed a serious condition of impending schizophrenia along with hysterical neuroses. 
and recommended that Lake return home to undergo to undergo psychiatric treatment in a hospital. And he was shipped back to California at the end of 1970. A psychiatric evaluation resulted in Lake being declared a danger to himself and to others. Nailed it. And he spent the better part of two months in the hospital psychiatric ward. And it's too bad he couldn't have spent the rest of his fucking life there. Karen would later recall a bizarre incident during Lake's psychiatric confinement. She said that Lake invaded a storage area one night to steal government property, failed to find the object of a search, which sent him into a deep depression, and he, that he, blamed, um, he blamed his failure on an attack of diarrhea. I told you he lost his shit. That's what I was referring to. He returned to his bed, began eating all the chocolate he could find because he thought that chocolate caused constipation. And if he became constipated enough, he could return to the storage area and carry out his original mission without shitting himself again. And the doctors, when they found out about this, they were, uh, you know, concerned. They performed further psychiatric examinations, recommended that Leonard Lake be discharged from the Marine Corps for medical reasons, which he was in January of 1971. Okay, now let's jump ahead eight years. Let's reconnect with Charlie Ng, who has just graduated high school, right, back in Hong Kong, and continue with his life until he is also done with the Marine Corps. And then from that point, it won't be much, uh, you know, further along until their timelines are intertwined. 1979, Charlie's parents consulted his uh, Aunt Alice, who had moved to San Leandro on the east side of the San Francisco Bay. She agreed to let Ing live with her and attend Notre Dame College, a small parochial school in the Bay's west side. With a student visa, Charlie arrived in the U.S. in early 1979. His aunt taught him how to drive that summer. Ing bought his first car, uh, which he actually wouldn't use for very long because he wrecked it three times in like a week. He started taking the bus. And when school started at Notre Dame, he moved into a dorm room. It lasted about a month there before dropping out. So interesting start to his uh, U.S. experience. Then in October of 1979, without informing any of his relatives, he marches into a U.S. Marine Corps recruiting station two months before his 19th birthday, and he enlists. He wasn't supposed to be able to do that since he wasn't a citizen, but he was somehow able to claim he was from Bloomington, Indiana. Ing would later claim that the recruiting sergeant helped him fake documents needed to prove citizenship. Not sure if that was true. Charlie enjoyed his experience, enjoyed boot camp, passed with flying colors, advanced infantry training at Camp Pendleton, north of San Diego, taught him how to proficiently use a variety of guns. The whole process ignited in Ing an interest in the uh, ability to survive nearly any challenge or hardship. Like Lake would do after he left the Marines, Charlie began to read publications on the subject of survivalism and to seek out other men with the same interests, a path that would later lead him to Leonard Lake. A fellow Marine, Ray Guzman, recalled, recalled that Ing was a loner at Camp Pendleton who often kept to himself, making few friends during his six months there. He also recalled that Charlie liked to practice martial arts and that he would show off by asking someone to hold a pencil at face level and then he would kick the pencil from the person's grasp. Upon completion of his training at the sprawling base in Southern California, Lance Corporal Ng was assigned to the 1st Battalion, 3rd Marine Regiment, Weapons Company at the Marine Corps Air Station, uh, Kaneo, uh, Kaneho, Kaneohe Bay, Hawaii. Oh, that's a tricky one. Uh, Kaneohe, Kaneohe, Kaneohe Bay, Hawaii. Uh, located on uh, Mogapu Peninsula, the base was the home of 5,000 Marines. Ng received training as an A gunner. He helped the lead gunner in the team operation of anti tank of an anti tank missile device. Intensive practice sessions designed to prepare the team for combat involved carrying the ammunition, helping to set up the weapon, assuring the lead gunner's safety during his vulnerable process of zeroing in on a target. According to Hugh Daughtry, Charlie's team leader, he did great. David Burns, a sergeant during Ng's tour of duty in Hawaii, saw him almost daily and rated Ng as an outstanding weapons handler who was a Marine of, quote, the best order. Hugh also remembered him to be a quiet loner who sometimes practiced martial arts in the barracks. Uh, Daughtry said, I never saw him drink, use drugs, or chase women. He was usually alone, even when I bumped into him on leave. The quiet loner. Gotta keep your eye on the quiet loner. Wait a minute. I'm actually off in the quiet loner. I'm not doing this. Shit. Just, uh, hey, forget about it. <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry about what I'm, what I'm up to. Forget what I said. Uh, now let's return to January 1971 after Leonard Lake is discharged. From his second tour of duty in Vietnam for psychiatric reasons, by the end of this little stretch, we'll be pretty close to joining these guys. January of 71, Leonard Lake is out of the facility. He's no longer eating tons of chocolate to plug his butt up so he can steal stuff. And he's back with his wife, Karen. He's the most stable he'll ever be again. Within a few days of his getting home, Lake and his wife, Karen, look for a place to settle and buy a home in San Jose at the lower tip of San Francisco Bay. Back when young people who didn't have wealthy parents, who uh, weren't, you know, IPO millionaires, could buy homes in Silicon Valley. According to Karen, the first few weeks were fairly normal, and both she and Leonard enrolled at West Valley Junior College to prepare for the future. Lake looked for a job and found a bunch of temporary ones. 
For a while, he drove a truck for a veterans organization. He worked as a laborer for a bit. Couldn't find anything that paid much more than minimum wage, and the couple had money problems. And uh, then they would continue to have money problems uh, after this, uh, mostly because Lake just he didn't he didn't like to work. He didn't he didn't you know he didn't enjoy a regular job. He, he felt a day job was beneath him. So he came up with a brilliant solution to avoid having to work. He just thought, why can't Karen, Karen, you know, his new wife, dance at a local topless bar? Boom! Problem solved! Karen made great money. The two of them lived happily ever after. When in doubt, take those titties out and dance. It always works. You can't lose doing that. I know in reality, uh, Karen at first was offended and rejected the idea, but Lake was pushy and persuasive. Soon she reluctantly auditioned and was accepted. And then she was working 45 to 50 hours a week, dancing for dollars. And while she worked, Leonard stayed at home and relaxed. He, he fucking won. He figured it out. He lived leisurely, and he started growing an organic garden and, you know, and fooling around with his wife. He's, he's a fucking champion, right? I mean, really. Uh, no, he wasn't. Um, he also, uh, you know, became uh, super controlling again, began to administer what he called controlled beatings of his wife. He would first strike her lightly to the face with his open hand, then later use his fist. He asked her if she liked it, and then they'd have sex. The beatings were his idea of foreplay. Uh, Karen uh, was not into that. Like, also took all the money Karen made. She worked. He controlled the finances. And then he started taking a lot of nude pics of Karen. Dude, loved a nude pic. He filled an album with revealing photos of his wife. And this is just the beginning. This is the beginning of uh, Adult Lake's nude photo taking. You're going to get so sick of hearing about all the nude pics he takes pretty soon. Lake also starts suggesting they meet another couple, and swap partners. Leonard, he also starts getting paranoid. He gave the phone company a fake name so they, they couldn't look him up. He said it would help them uh, screen out, you know, telemarketers. Karen also said that Leonard insisted around this time that she read The Collector the only book he would ever pressure her to read. He told her it was special. It was different than any other book. Uh-huh. Psychopath. Not long after Lake had made an album of nude photos of her, Karen found out that her husband had been using his free time to take naked pictures of a lot of other women. While she worked at the strip club, he was at home banging random ladies and taking nude pics. So basically, married life is going great for Karen. And then in November, just 10 months after he'd been discharged from the Marines, an incident at the strip club leads to the end of Karen and Lake's young marriage. Karen has been walked to her car after her shift you know, by a strip club customer. Leonard pulls up, sees her walk with another man, becomes furious, assumes, you know, that she's cheating, says he's going to throw her out of the house. You know, he's one of those guys, only I can cheat. You know, he's going to throw her out of the house, the place where her, her income pays their rent. He peels out, and by the time she makes it home, all her shit is on the lawn. She loads what stuff she can fit into her car, sleeps in the car that night. She goes to work the next day. Leonard breaks into her car, takes most of her stuff, gets rid of it, she finds a new place to stay for, you know, weeks. Leonard would routinely break into her place while she was working and do weird shit, like pour acid onto her clothes just to destroy her clothes. Uh, he'd call her, you know, random hours, tell her what she was, uh, what she had done that day, let her know that he knew what she was wearing, who she had visited. He wanted to know that he was you know, watching her. He'd call and leave threatening messages on her, on her answering machine. After months of harassment, Leonard finally moves on and Karen divorces him in early 1972. And Karen... When she would later hear what Lake did, uh, I imagine had to feel super thankful that Lake tossed her shit out on the lawn. She got off very easy in comparison to other women who would meet Lake in the future. Leonard's half-sister, Janet, later recalled that Leonard cried when he found out that Karen had divorced him. She said it was the only time she had ever seen him cry, and she thinks this is when his hatred of women truly began. I think it was much earlier. <laughs> Why is, how is he crying in this situation? Why, Janet? How could she do this to me? All he ever did was beat her and talk him to stripping and not work and never look for a job and take a nude pictures of other women I was sleeping with when she wasn't home. And then she leaves me for that? I'm such a good guy. He's a piece of shit. He's a piece of shit in 71. He'd only become a bi bigger piece of shit as time went on. After his divorce, Lake gets evicted from his place since he, you know, he can't pay rent because he doesn't have a job. He does some couch surfing. He stays with various relatives, including his grandparents. And then he uh, puts out a personal ad in the Berkeley Barb. 1972's version of Match or Tinder. The Barb was a big counterculture newspaper, one of the nation's first. And in late 1972, 28-year-old Jennifer Gordon responds to his ad, you know, just a, like a hookup ad. By October of 72, the two were dating. Gordon later recalled, at first, he was like someone you see in the movies. Sweet, gentle, caring. He seemed concerned, like someone you'd really like to know. Within three months, the intimacy turned, in Jennifer's words, kinky, bondage, and swinging. Eventually, Lake convinced Jennifer to earn money for them through prostitution. She'd later say she agreed uh, to do that to make him happy. Taylor Helzer from the Children of Thunder cult from two weeks ago. Man, he'd be pissed to read this. What? He actually got her to work as an expert, ask, escort for him. Less than two years back from now, I tried so hard to get any woman 
to, to work as a prostitute for years. Nothing. I offered them fucking vision and dental. Nothing. Uh, Lake also took a shit ton of nude photos of Jennifer. Three albums worth of nude photos. Jennifer also helped convince a few of her girlfriends to pose for Leonard's camera as well so he could fill up some other books. She'd later say that Lake even took nude photos of her while she was asleep. Just, just couldn't get enough. He's taking nude pictures of her day, today, during the day, taking nude pictures of her friends. She falls asleep. He's taking some more pics. Uh, despite Jennifer doing whatever Lake asked of her in bed, despite her paying the bills through prostitution, he still wasn't satisfied. And then when uh, Lake, or, you know, or when she decided, Jennifer decided to give up prostitution, she said Leonard became irate. We argued a lot. The relationship started getting rocky. Jennifer realized things just weren't going to last. When Lake started talking about snuff films, she said he confessed he wanted to make a movie where two people were having sex and then one of them kills the other during climax. Lake told her he thought this would be the ultimate sexual high. And when she told him that wanting to do things like that could put him in prison, he told her, he told her that if he was ever arrested, he would uh, escape the consequences by killing himself by taking cyanide. Years before he would eventually be caught, he is already planning his escape. Uh, after some snuff film talk, Jennifer uh, somehow doesn't leave Lake. Bad, bad call. Always leave when your partner says that what they really like to do in bed is kill their sexual partner so they can, so they can come harder. That should always be a deal breaker. Uh, the two argue and fight constantly in the spring of 73 and then in June, the day after Jennifer is worried that Lake is going to kill her. After he's pinned her to the floor after an argument, she finally moves out. In late 1973, Lake continues to develop more and more dark sexual fantasies, most of them revolving around having a sex slave. He also starts to think a lot about the end of the world. He's super stable. He thinks the world is likely going to end in a nuclear holocaust, and he uh, thinks that to survive it, he has to get out of the city. He needs to get out to the country where he can rely on his survivalist training to survive. He begins to dream of building a remote apocalyptic bunker, some place where he can wait out the initial period of nuclear radiation by having protective gear, filtered air supply, tons of water, lots of provisions. And he starts to scope out Ukiah, California, about 130 miles north of where he lived in the city. And then one day, he just, he just leaves. He just grabs what few possessions he has, gets in his car, drives up to the 12,000-person town, 12,000 people then, to start a new life. Uh, in the suck first, if you have an incredible memory, you may remember Ukiah from the Jonestown Massacre Suck that we did three years ago, back in May of 2017. Can't believe it's been three years since we did that topic. Jim Jones had read an article about Ukiah being a top 10 place to ride out a nuclear apocalypse and had moved 140 Jonestown cult followers from Indiana to the Redwood Valley just north of Ukiah in 1965. Jones would establish a socialist compound there and followers of his would stay there until 1974, leaving the area when Guyana down in South America became the new primary compound. In late 1973, when you know, Leonard Lake moved to the area. Jones and his people temple, people's temple followers were splitting time between San Francisco and Ukiah, and I'm sure Lake knew of them. I sailed this to establish that the area in and around Ukiah was used to different kinds of people moving in and living in new ways by the time Lake got there. The following year, 1974, the Dharma Realm Buddhist Association purchased the defunct Mendocino State Asylum for the Insane and began building the City of 10,000 Buddhas, the largest Buddhist community in the Western Hemisphere on nearly 500 acres of land, a theistic city with housing for monks, dining halls, educational centers, all kinds of stuff. So Ukiah had all kinds of different, you know, different kinds of people living in it. Lake found a job at a government-funded firm that renovated low-income housing, quickly worked his way up to becoming a crew leader, supervising a crew of other guys. He also enrolled in nearby Mendocino College, taking classes in animal sciences, meat cutting, he learned how to use kitchen knives and carpentry saws, how to expertly slice through bone and flesh. Could have helped him later when he disposed of uh, uh, bodies. He convinced college staff to let him teach an, as an adjunct professor, teaching a wilderness survival class. He lived uh, you know, in a, in a cheap pay-by-the-week motel before moving into what locals called the ranch. Let's talk about the ranch for a little bit. In the western rise of the Coast Range Mountains that cast shadows over Ukiah early each evening, a winding road ascends just north of town, towards the area of the formal, former People's Temple compound. A 10-mile drive through lush forest leads to an unmarked road that leads to the ranch. The ranch is difficult to find, and the people who lived in the hidden hills and valleys like it that way. Or I guess the ranch was hard to find. Not, not totally sure if it's still around. It was founded in 1970, a rural ecological paradise for people who wish to escape pollution, noise, traffic, and social restrictions. You know, there's a lot of nudists and swingers living there. The ranch consisted of 5,000 acres, approximately nine square miles. Originally, 200 families bought parcels of the ranch, varying from 40 to 200 acres of the undeveloped land. 
Electric power for uh, the scattered rustic houses, cabins, and mobile homes was generated by solar or hydro-powered sources. Water came from wells, pumped by windmills, uh, or up, you know, from creeks, shared by all. No telephone cables or other utilities mucked up the landscape. There was a common area of 400 acres that included a large barn with a ranch house, a pond, a school. Roads on the property were maintained to the labor of the residents, funded by the community. The ranch land, so it's kind of like a compound communal living type experiment, but you get your own spot, but it's also very communal. The Ranch Landowners Association drew up bylaws prohibiting the use of pesticides or firearms. Generally, the people who chose to live on the ranch were hippies who respected Mother Earth, resisted anything that might pollute the land, water, or air. These were people who went by nicknames like Otter, Zephyr, Beaver, Morning Glory. They celebrated the summer solstice by donning medieval costumes, dancing and singing, skinny dipping in a creek. And you know what? Good for them. If you want to, you know, be called Otter and live in a nudist, environmentalist compound of sorts, well, good for you. For the right person, I'm sure it was awesome. I mean, I, could, I couldn't do it. I couldn't call people Beaver and Morning Glory and, and keep a straight face. I'm too much of a sarcastic asshole. I just couldn't, I couldn't live that life. Hey, Beaver, <laughs> how's the windmill coming along? Looking good in that jester hat and medieval leggings there, bud. Hey, you want to come over tonight and drink some mead? Howl at the moon? Swap wives? Ah, kuma matata, my friend. Uh, one person who did love the ranch was Venus Salem, a single woman in her 30s, one of those 60s flower power kids who wasn't ready to move on from the 60s. Venus had bought a parcel on the ranch in 1970, worked to improve it while she continued to live in Ukiah, earning her living as an occupational therapist. By 1974, Venus had about ran out of money. She wanted to upgrade the cabin she'd built and plant an orchard, but she needed help. And then she met Leonard Lake at some sort of hippie festival where the two probably talked about summer solstice magic and holistic medicine and light therapy or shit. Venus told Lake about her cabin and her wishes to improve it, and Lake knew a free ride when he saw one, and he offered to do all the work for six months in exchange for living for free on the property. And at first, Venus found Leonard charming and helpful, and they became romantically involved. And then he showed her his nude photo albums and asked her to take some nude pics. Classic Lake! Lake being Lake. She didn't care for it. How the fuck do you bring that up, by the way? A bunch of nude photos of previous partners. Damn, baby. God, you look sexy. Seriously. Fuck, you look good. Hey, yeah, we should take some pictures of you naked. I mean, you could be in Playboy, sir. You have a great body. It's not, it's not a big deal. No, oh, no, lots of women take naked pictures. Like uh, like my ex, Jennifer. Hey, check check out this uh, these photo albums. I have these three photo albums of my ex, Jennifer. Check out this pic with her with some dude who, uh, who paid to fuck her while I watched. Uh, oh, oh, and look at this uh, pic of my ex-wife, Karen. Uh, she had just gotten home from the strip club. Hey, hey, why are you, why are you upset, Venus? What? I'm not supposed to look at all these photo albums of naked pics of women? I'm not supposed to have 47 photo albums of fucking women I used to screw around with naked? <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, did not read you for a socially and sexually unliberated prude, Venus. In addition to showing her nude pics of women he used to date, Leonard also told Venus his mom abandoned him, that he hated his brother Donnie. Donnie was a piece of shit who mooched off their mom. He wished he could kill Donnie. <laughs> he tells this to a lot of people. It's a weird thing to constantly talk about. He also told her he was excited for what he called his Miranda project, but he didn't give all the details. Said he wanted to build some type of refuge for people driven from the cities during a coming environmental collapse. That He convinced her was very possible, if not probable. You know, but he didn't want a refuge. He wanted a fuck dungeon where he could rape and torture women and make snuff films. He began to dig a giant pit on Venus's property for his Miranda project. Venus later said Lake started to get mean with her a few months into the relationship, started criticizing her all the time, started to alienate her from her neighbors. When she finally got up the courage to confront him over his terrible behavior, he became enraged, pushed her off a ladder. Argument settled. I'm sorry, what were you saying again, Venus? It's hard to hear you ever since I pushed you off the ladder. Uh, Venus wanted him gone, but he refused to leave. And instead, he offered to buy her interest in a property. He made her a terrible offer, but she took it just to get rid of him. She might have saved her own life by doing so. So now Richard owns her ranch property and he quickly became a huge headache for the rest of the ranch community that never wanted him there. A neighbor would later recall meeting Leonard around this time and she said he creeped her out when he brought up his albums of nude photos and said like, said that he would like to take some nude pics of her. Classic Lake, right? He doesn't, fight, he doesn't waste time bringing up the nude photos and the albums. Hey, name's Leonard. Nice to meet you. I live here now. Hey, do uh, you take nude photos? I'm a photographer. And if you're not busy, I was thinking that you could take your clothes off and I could snap. Where, where are you going? What? What the 
fuck? I thought this place was supposed to be a bunch of cool nudists, not a bunch of Debbie Downers. In another instance, the same neighbor said Lake saw her 10-year-old daughter playing outside and hinted that he wanted to take pictures of her as well. Nude pictures. I picture this dude literally asking to take nude pics of any woman or girl he meets, just everywhere. You know, he's just at the grocery store. Uh, no, I'm uh, uh, paying, paying cash. Yeah, paying cash. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I can throw in a, a few extra bucks if you, uh, if you wouldn't mind just, you know, quickly getting naked. I can take some, take some pics of you. You know, he's holding, holding the door open for some senior citizen somewhere. You're welcome. Uh, I'd love to take some nude pics if you ever have time. Uh, you, know, you know where I'm at. Take care. Applying for a job as a school bus driver. Hey, as long as I'm not on the clock, can I use the bus for group photos of nude kids? Show myself out? Okay. Uh, Lake sketched his neighbor uh, out further when he referenced Operation Miranda and spoke of a nuclear apocalypse. He also said, worst case, if he couldn't survive the nukes, he's not going to suffer because he'll just take the cyanide pills that he always carries around. He told her, I carry death in my pocket. <laughs> he's f- fucking crazy. Uh, this is still the beginning of this shit. Uh, basically, for the rest of the story, Lake will talk about nude photos, cyanide pills, and a nuclear apocalypse and Operation Miranda to everyone he meets. A guy who worked on one of Lake's crews around this time remembered Lake talking about Operation Miranda as well, said he also uh, brought his photo albums to work so he could show his coworkers. Said he was constantly talking about sex. Of course he was. Shortly after Venus left, Lake threw a nude party at his house at the ranch. Food, drink, no clothes. Also to build his future sex dungeon, he started stealing shit from work. Uh, he started uh, ordering more construction supplies that were needed for the job. And he would take home excess building materials. He'd use the machinery from work, like, a, like the bulldozer, to work on his apocalyptic bunker. He also let a local 18-year-old dude, Bobby Barnes, live in a little one-room cabin on the property in exchange for Bobby working for him excavating, you know, and doing other jobs, you know, digging holes and whatnot. Bobby would later recall Richard talking about how much he hated his mom, how he wanted to kill Donnie. (laughs) And he showed Bobby his nude photo albums and talked about cyanide. He hit all the fucking major lake points. I I picture, I picture him with some people like, Hey, did I talk to you about cyanide yet? Okay. Hey, hold on. I, I, I fucking, I'll kill myself before, you know, apocalypse gets me. You hear what I'm saying? Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 I just wanted to get that. Make sure I cleared that out. You know, I just, I, I get anxious. If I haven't showed you nude pics, uh, tried to take nude pictures of you, uh, talked about cyanide, or referenced the nuclear apocalypse. Bobby would later remember Lake not getting along with any of his neighbors. And he talked about uh, how if any of them trespassed onto his property, he would not hesitate to shoot and kill them and bury them in one of the pits he dug. <laughs> Lake was not kidding when he said this. He was a psychotic neighbor. He would do exactly this in the future. Bobby's 18-year-old girlfriend came to stay with him for uh, several weeks, you know, stay, stay with Bobby. And her 19-year-old friend Gina Travers came along. Uh, to visit numerous times. And Lake, of course, talked to the girls about, <laughs> I bet you can guess it, cyanide pills, apocalypse, Operation Miranda. Uh, and he showed them nude photo albums, tried to fuck them, and tried to take nude pics of them. He did talk Gina into taking some nude pics. She'd later say she immediately regretted it. When numerous ranch residents were later interviewed about Lake after his arrest and subsequent uh, death, they would universally talk about hating his fucking guts. These open-minded people, many of them nudists and swingers, thought he was a dirty creep and asshole. And that's saying a lot. Lake constantly broke the ranch bylaws. He wasn't supposed to use bulldozers to excavate the land. He wasn't supposed to use firearms, but he shot his guns all the time anyways. He constantly said creepy shit about the women and the girls living there. He skeeved everybody out. But almost no one confronted him because they truly believed he might kill them if they did. And uh, they were right to think that. In the mid and late 70s, Lake was constantly trying to get more photos for his albums, not just from women at the ranch, but from other area women and girls as well, like Cindy Morgan. In the spring of 1979, Lake took some photos of a 16-year-old, Cindy, whose mom wanted portraits of her daughter with Sir Lancelot, a goat a neighbor of Lake's had, that's uh, this hippie dude named Otter, he'd attached a single horn to, or kind of like melded the goat's horns in this, this bizarre surgery. It's, you, can find, you can see pictures of this thing online. Otter apparently, you know, he, he figured out how to turn a goat <laughs> into a unicorn, and everyone around Ukiah knew about it, which does sound like something... You know, exactly this is like something that somebody named Otter would do. What's you, what's you working on, Otter? Uh, just just trying to turn this goat into a unicorn. Sounds about right. Take care. Good luck, Otter. During the photo shoot, when Cindy's mom stepped away, Lake asked her if she'd like to take some more adult photos, <laughs> a.k.a. nudie pics. Uh, she said no. Then for weeks, Leonard started showing up at places around Ukiah where Cindy would be, hitting her up for those pics. He was fucking obsessed. Eventually, she agreed. Later, she said she agreed just to get him off her back. Ridiculous. They met in a warm afternoon in an isolated spot by the Russian River. Lake shot several rolls of film, and she's lucky she made it out of the forest alive. Uh, Lake also had been hitting up Darlene Davis for nude photos since 1977, when she was 13. Leonard befriended her parents in 1977, 
and he soon offered her rides on his three-wheel ATV, and she accepted, and for some reason, her dumb fuck parents let their 13-year-old daughter go for rides alone into the woods with a dude everyone knew was a perv who was constantly showing everyone nude photos of women he'd, you know, previously slept with. December of 1979, Lake invited now 15-year-old Darlene to sneak out of her parents' house, meet him at his cabin. She does, and the 34-year-old takes her virginity. He also soon convinced her to, of course, pose nude for a series of photos, and he starts trying to talk her into group sex. The two continue to have a secret off-and-on sexual relationship for years afterwards. Lake even gave her a necklace with, check this out, cyanide capsule in it. Ah, weird. In case the nuke started dropping, uh, but she refused to wear it. 1980, Darlene's parents finally woke up to what was happening with Lake and their daughter and sent Darlene to a boarding school. The two would continue to stay in touch, with Lake writing her often. Around this time, when Lake wasn't busy fucking or taking nude photos of local teens, he was focused on his survivalist training. <laughs> Why has this been coming up so much lately, too? I swear I had no idea this dude was a prepper when I picked this topic. Lake uh, put an ad to meet other survivalists in the back of Soldier of Fortune magazine. He used an alias, Tom Myers, to maintain anonymity. And he met a 21-year-old soldier named Mark Novak, stationed in Fort Lewis, Washington, a man who would soon lead him to his future kill buddy, Charles Ng. Novak stayed with Lake for a few days at the ranch, heard all kinds of stories about what a badass Lake had been in Nam, about his prowess with women, all kinds of stuff. He saw Lake's photo albums. He'd later characterize Lake as a shit talker. And after three days, Novak left and never returned. But he did keep loosely in touch with Lake. After Novak left, Lake got quickly back to uh, creeping Ukiah women the fuck out. He tried talking to a lo local young cute shop owner named Pamela into some, taking some nude photos with him when she wouldn't take any pics. <laughs> After looking at one of his albums and seeing nude girls as young as 10 in it, he uh, approached her younger sister, Tracy. And then Tracy's boyfriend, a member of the local sheriff's posse, found out about all this and made it clear to Lake that he would fucking end him if he didn't leave everyone alone. So he did. He left those girls alone. So yay, Tracy's boyfriend. World needs more men like him. If only he would have ended Lake. Also around this time, Lake uh, steals a bunch of his neighbor's shit. During Lake's extended residency on the ranch, other members of the community suffered a mysterious rash of a lot of burglaries. Number of power tools disappeared, chainsaws, and Ukiah throughout Mendocino County. A lot of rifles, handguns, and ammo would be stolen when Lake was around. Demolition firm even lost several boxes of dynamite. Then in late summer 1980, Lake met the love of his life at a renaissance fair in Marin County, just north of the Golden Gate Bridge, Carolyn Cricket Balaz. Mm -hmm. Perfect. First Venus, now Cricket. Oh, man. He, did, he didn't live a boring life. I'll give him that. She actually, sexually, Lake met his match with Cricket. Cricket was bisexual, had no qualms about fantasies of sharing their bed with another, another woman, using sex toys, participating in bondage and domination. Cricket also loved posing for his cameras. When he took her to his house at the ranch, she loved the isolation and natural setting. Despite declaring his love for Cricket, he continued to write long letters to Darlene Davis at her boarding school. According to Davis, years later, he sent her, quote, tons and tons of nude photographs, <laughs> including a bunch of his new girlfriend, Cricket. Uh, many of the photos were of the two of them having sex. He informed Darlene that Cricket is bisexual and wants a female partner, as well as a woman to have three ways with. So he's hoping that Darlene and Cricket can, you know, both be as ladies at the ranch. He can have two Mirandas, at least as a start, for a start. They can help find more women to take uh, more nude pics with. And Lake does continue to try and fuck uh, and take photos of other women in the area as well. While this is all going on, he starts to really wear out his welcome at the ranch. Around this time, another ranch neighbor gets fed up with Lake's constant target practice, pointing out that a stray bullet could kill someone. And Lake responds by shouting, I could kill everyone on this ranch one by one. I could go to every house with an automatic weapon and no one would ever know. And that neighbor responds by shouting the fuck up and not confronting Lake ever again. Lake was a nightmare of a neighbor, a neighbor from hell. Shortly after this incident, a storage shed on Lake's property erupts into flames one afternoon. Local volunteers rush over to help put out the fire, and then the shed explodes. The firefighters leap for cover behind trees, trying to avoid flying bullets and shrapnel. Lake almost kills some of these people because of all the ammo he had stored in that shed, ammo not allowed under ranch bylaws. Then shortly after this no-no, Lake's employers at the housing rehabilitation firm catch Lake finally stealing the building material and call the police. Lake gets fired, obviously, spends several days in jail before being released on bond. A lenient judge sentences him to a year on probation, and when a committee from the ranch hears of his arrest, they ask Lake to sell his property and move out, or they will have attorneys force him out. Within a few days, he and Cricket pack up and leave. The Ukiah chapter of Lake's life is over. Everyone at the ranch breathes a huge sigh of relief. 
And they return to tending their unicorn goats and talking about alternative energy sources and walking around nude and, you know, uh, forming and playing in drum circles, whatnot. In mid-1981, Psychotic Lake and Cricket moved to Philo, California. Philo is a tiny hamlet located in the Anderson Valley. Situated in the rolling foothills of California's Trinity Alps, only about uh, 20 miles west of Ukiah. It's an area a lot of wineries and yoga retreats now. It used to be a logging and farming town. No more than 150 citizens lived in Philo in 1981, several of them, in, uh, several of them employed by a lumber company. Lake and Cricket rent a room at the no longer there Philo Motel. The motel owner, Lake learned, needed, some, needed someone to occupy and manage the place. So Leonard and Cricket decided to stay. She landed a part-time job at the Anderson Valley Elementary School as a teacher's aide. Settling into a routine at Philo, Lake met Robert Glover, captain of the Anderson Valley Fire Department. The two men hit it off. Lake becomes one of 40 unpaid volunteer firemen in the county. Soon after settling in, Lake placed an ad in the Bay Guardian, a San Francisco publication that stopped being published in 2014. His ad looked innocent enough. Nothing more than an offer of employment for someone willing to relocate to a small rural town to help operate and maintain a little motel. 18-year-old Connie Richards reads it, needs a job. The attractive young woman rides a Greyhound bus 120 miles north, steps off and into the welcoming embrace of Leonard and Cricket. They explain that she will receive room and board in exchange for helping with motel chores. And then it didn't take long for Connie to recognize what they really wanted, a sex partner. And Lake, of course, wanted to take nude pics of her, uh, which he did. Uh, Richard recalled that she wasn't really into all the BDSM stuff that Cricket wanted. She said they had all kinds of restraints and masks and whips and different things. She had a one three-way with the couple, then had sex a few more times with Cricket. And she said uh, Cricket was the kinky one, while Lake was more gentle. Interesting. Uh, after Lake and Ng would be caught for rapes and murders many years later, there would be a lot of speculation that Cricket not only knew about everything that they were up to, but was a, a big-time participant in Operation Miranda and may have participated in the sexual torture of, uh, you know, various captive women. Leonard will also allegedly tell Richards that he wanted to have sex with his half-sister, Janet. Weird. And he made sure to tell her that he hated Brother Donnie, wanted him dead, and that he had cyanide pills. Can't forget that. And he had his cyanide pills that he was ready to take at a moment's notice. He also brags that he has $30,000 in silver buried on the property. Lake was uh, also continued to send pics and steamy letters to Darlene Davis, that boarding school. He's consistent with his creepiness. September 13, 1981, Lake, Cricket, and Connie Richards drive to Morgan Hill, where Lake and Cricket take vows of marriage. Connie stay in Philo, lasts only three months, feeling that she served no real purpose other than uh, as a sex object. She says goodbye to Leonard and Cricket 14 days before Christmas, heads back down to uh, Southern California, or well, heads back down south to the Bay Area. She also says goodbye to a short, quiet Asian man named Charlie, who had arrived two weeks earlier. Yes, Charles Ng. His timeline is finally connecting to Leonard Lakes now. Uh, how? Well, last time we checked in with him, he was trying to make friends with fellow Marines in Hawaii. Well, let's back up a few months and show how Charlie meets Leonard right after a quick little sponsor break right here. Today's Time Suck is brought to you by Leonard Lake's Quick Hit Nudie Picks Mobile Photography Studio. Photos are expensive. Wedding photos can cost you thousands of dollars. Prom pics can cost you hundreds. Graduation pics, who can afford them? Family reunion, senior picks, on and on. It never ends. What if you want all those photos, but you don't want to spend any money? Well, if you're willing to provide a slim young female who will take some quick hit nudie pics, Lake will take the rest of your photos for free. This offer is not too good to be true. Leonard Lake will be more than happy to meet your young lady for a quick hit nudie pic session, the location of her or your choosing, and then the rest of your photos are free. And don't worry, Lake will not try to fuck you. He will try to fuck your young lady. Classic Lake move. And he'll try to fuck every other woman in your circle of friends. And when he asks those other women for a quick hit nudie pics, please tell them not to be offended. That's just Lake being Lake. And if they agree to take those photos, don't forget to tell them, ha ha, he got you. You just got laked. And that, of course, is not our sponsor for today. <laughs> I wish it was. It'd be a great extra sponsor. Uh, here comes the real ones. Thank you, by the way, for supporting these sponsors who support our show. Now let's continue. By reconnecting with Charles Ng in 1981, shortly before he meets Leonard Lake in California. During his time in the Marines, Charlie Ng developed a strong interest in survivalism that led to an acquaintanceship in the summer of 81 with a man from a different branch of the service, young Army Corporal stationed at the center of Oahu at Schofield Barracks, Mark Motherfucking Novak. Remember that name? 
Ng met Novak in an Oahu military surplus store where they bonded over talk of weapons, tactics, methods of staying alive in the wild. They grabbed some lunch together. And Novak told Ng of an interesting survivalist he'd met in Northern California at a place called The Ranch the year before in the spring of 1980. Novak said the man introduced himself as Tom Myers, but he later learned his real name was Leonard Lake. And Lake, he said, may have been a shit talker about a lot of stuff, but he did know a lot about weapons. And he did have a very impressive collection of nude photos of young women. And Ng was like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. What, what was that last part? Uh, you have my attention. Please, please do tell me more. In this initial chance meeting, or after it, Ng and Novak stay in touch for the next few months, become friends. And then that September, Ng planned his first known major criminal operation, uh, gun smuggling. All the weapons assigned to Ng's Marine Company were stored in a locker, uh, locked armory when not in use, and armed guards were posted at the secured entry to this facility 24 hours a day. And in early September 1981, when Lake and Cricket are getting married back in California, Ng drew guard duty at the armory in Hawaii. During his watch, an idea formed in his mind, what if he could steal some of the more valuable rifles, grenades, handguns, and other arms and sell them? Ng talked a, few, a fellow Marine into helping him, and he threatened another fellow Marine with physical violence to help him as well. Uh, excuse me. And they pulled off the theft of a bunch of weapons, took the guns to a man who was going to, you know, take them to a buyer. And then someone ratted them all out when the weapons turned up missing. I'm guessing the guy he threatened was probably the rat. Maybe not the best way to get someone to help you in a criminal enterprise by threatening them. Several days after the theft, Naval Investigative Service officers arrest Charles. He's charged with conspiracy to commit larceny of military weapons, theft of weapons, including machine guns, grenade launchers, rifles and pistols, and burglary to commit theft. Then on the morning of Friday, November 13th, 1981, two Marine guards called chasers in military jargon deliver Ng from the brig where he's being held, you know, to the NIS office to be interrogated. He's questioned until 2.30 the following morning, and then no transportation is available to return him to the brig. So the chasers escort him into a squad bay. While one of the men sits down, allowing Ng to move freely about the room, the other chaser steps into the duty NCO's office to call transportation authorities, figure out what's going to go on with the, uh, you know, vehicle. The man closest to Ng, exhausted and drowsy, lets his head drop for just a few moments, but it's long enough for Ng to make a break for it. He escapes out an open back window, makes it to the house of a fellow Marine who let him crash for the night. This friend gives him food, water, and clothing the next morning, drives him to a remote area where he can camp out in the jungle. And then in the jungle for two days, Ng huddles with no tent, afraid to make a fire. He's soaked. He's miserable, having nowhere else to turn. He makes it to a phone, calls Army Pal Sergeant Mark motherfucking Novak. Stays with Novak for two days in the barracks, contacts his parents who wire him $300, uses the money to buy clothing, a backpack, and a plane ticket to San Francisco. Then Novak gives him the name and address of Leonard Lake and Philo. Novak call, uh, calls Lake, who agrees to helping out. Ng leaves Schofield Barracks before dawn on a November morning, 1981, catches a bus to the airport, hides in the airport bathroom until his flight boards, then flies to San Francisco where he makes it to his aunt's house. Then he calls Lake, who invites him out to Philo. When Charlie Ng shows up in Philo, Lake realizes that Connie Richards had already made a decision to leave, so he figures this newcomer can take over the chores that she'd been doing. And then he and Ng get to know each other and become fast friends. Ng loves the idea of preparing for the end times. He is more than willing to use his military training to commit whatever crimes, and I mean whatever crimes, are necessary to pull off Operation Miranda. Ng loves Operation Miranda. Ng fuels the flames of Lake's dark fantasies. They're two very fucked up peas in a very fucked up pot. The nature of just how well these two got along together would later be revealed, later be revealed in a variety of ways in trial testimony. According to a Bay Area police report, a woman who worked for an escort service in the city stated that a man calling himself Tom Myers, so Leonard Lake, had arranged to use her services in 1984. After paying in advance, he asked, of course, to take some nude pics. Lake then first took her out to dinner, then to a motel where she posed for him. When she emerged from the bathroom, a short Asian man lunged her with a knife, forced her to lie down on the bed while repeatedly stabbing at the mattress within inches of her head. The woman told police the Asian brutally raped her while Myers watched. During the sexual assault, Myers commented, this is something we do all the time, but we usually kill the girls we've been with. But I like you, so we're not going to kill you. The victim later identified Tom Myers as, of course, Leonard Lake, and the rapist she identified as, of course, Charles Ng. Now for the rest of this timeline, there will be very little back and forth between Ng and Lake's life now that they've joined forces. Join, yeah, joined forces. December of 81. Shortly after Ng's arrival at Philo, Lake and Cricket give up their motel management job. A better opportunity comes along. A woman who lived nearby in a property called Indian Creek Ranch wanted to start a youth camp. So 
was she started looking for sex fiends, child pornographers, and doomsday rapists. And she's like, aha, I found them. Uh, no, she didn't. But that is basically who she did find. She owned a, seclu a secluded cluster of one-story wooden buildings, including a white house trimmed in red, detached guest quarters, a barn-like structure used as a workshop, located near a meandering stream 300 yards off the highway. When she learned about Lake's military background and interest in survivalism, she decided that he and his teacher's aide wife would be well qualified to manage the camp. Uh, boy, was she wrong. Lake ended his arrangement at the motel, happily accepted the youth camp offer. The motel owner was glad to see him go. The motel owner would later say that he'd been dealing with complaints about Lake, peeping on nude guests, trying to take their pictures. Lake and his fucking photo albums. My God, this guy went hard on that fetish. Uh, one time when the motel owner had dropped in to check on Lake's work, he found several hand grenades sitting on a table. He asked if they were live, and Lake said, quote, go ahead and pull the pin and find out. I imagine that he added a creepy laugh at the end of that. Go ahead and pull the pin and find out. <laughs> See how lucky you are today, you know? Yeah, you check out these photos. Hey, have I talked to you about cyanide? Local man named Ernie Perdini and his wife helped Lake and Cricket and Charlie move into their new home. They quickly grew to hate Leonard. He had that effect on a lot of people. Lake being Lake, he invited Ernie and his wife to come over and watch some porn uh, and then hinted about how he'd like to take some nude pics of Ernie's wife once they got there. Fuck yeah, bro. Oh, you thought you were just coming over to watch some porn? Nah, son. You came over to do some porn. You just got Lake, Ern. Ernie and his lady weren't amused. He ended up challenging Lake to a fight. Lake told him, I won't fight you. I'm a coward. But then he said that maybe later he would shoot him. And then Ernie talked about how he had guns too. And maybe later he'd shoot Lake. And then the two never spoke again. Well done, Ernie. You out crazy that crazy. Shortly after moving into their new spot, Lake Ng and Cricket got kicked the fuck out of Philo. The FBI, working closely with the Mendocino County Sheriff's Office, had received a tip that Charles Ng, fugitive, wanted by the U.S. Marine Corps, was hiding out with Lake and Philo. On April 29th, 1982, the task force, consisting of nine FBI officers, a half a dozen sheriff's deputies, and Sheriff Stephen Satterwhite, deployed in unmarked cars, a helicopter, and a fixed-wing aircraft and moved in on the trio. They launched the operation at 9.15 in the morning, springing from the noisy chopper several vehicles. Very dramatic. As the officers surrounded the central camp area, one of them spotted Charles Ng vaulting from a bedroom window. Officers ran him down on an open field. They hustled him into the helicopter for a quick flight to Ukiah's County Jail. Agents also caught Leonard Lake after he sprinted inside a house. Uh, you know, everyone speculated to hide some evidence. Inside Ng's room were a pair of rifles, nunchucks, billy club, and a rumpled bed. Lake was captured in a room containing a small arsenal of weapons. Lake said a few of the guns were his, but the rest were Charlie's. Lake told agents that Charlie was a guest who helped with odd chores. Didn't mention him being a rape and kill buddy. He forgot that part, I guess. Looking further around the property, agents turned up six handguns, six rifles, several of them fully automatic, along with hand grenades, TNT, a silencer, tear gas, several boxes of ammo. Lake also volunteered that Ng had brought a MAC-10 assault weapon and a sound suppressor, converted to a fully auto, uh, fully automatic you know, weapon, which he knew was illegal. Uh, a few other stolen guns were found in Ng's room, along with more martial arts weapons. Cricket was detained, but Lake insisted she knew nothing of the weapons cache. Most of the guns Lake said had been purchased by Ng through mail order. The dynamite, according to Lake, had been sent by Ng from Hawaii prior to his arrival in Philo. Lake was placed under arrest and sent uh, with a deputy to the county jail in Ukiah as well. On the way to jail, Lake asked a female deputy if they could pull over really quick so he could snap a few quick nude pics. Uh, he, he didn't. But it feels like something he could do. It feels like that's something he would try to do. You know, at least throw that out there. Play the numbers. Look, I get that I've been arrested. I get that. I understand you have to put me behind bars. And you got a job to do. You know, we all do. But hey, is having fun illegal? Answer, answer that, you know. Is making citizens happy illegal? If like, Look, if I'm still going to end up in jail, I just don't see what the big deal is about, you know, us pulling over and, you know, me taking a couple nude pics there, Officer Sugar Tits. So let's answer the million dollar question and find out how photogenic that pussy is. Why are you so mad at me? Uh, Cricket was left at the compound. She immediately drove to the county seat, helped Lake post bail. They returned to Indian Creek Ranch the following morning. Follow-up investigation by Sheriff Satterwhite revealed that several of the weapons had been stolen in recent Mendocino County burglaries. Not surprising. Charged with 17 felony counts, including firearms violations, the violations of probation from the previous bur burglary and theft in Ukiah. Lake faced what would very likely be a lengthy prison sentence. And Lake decided he could uh, either take some cyanide or he could flee. Doing the time was not going to be an option, and he chose to flee. He was not ready to give up on Operation Miranda, so he failed to show up at his scheduled court hearing and began living the rest of his life as a fugitive. Cricket went to live with their parents in San Bruno, down in the Bay Area, but would frequently visit Lake for the rest of his life. 
Uh, Charles Ng found himself on a military plane headed toward Hawaii to face a military trial. Between being jailed, waiting for his trial, his trial, and his sentence, he ended up being behind bars for two years and two months. I'm surprised it's not longer. He began his actual prison sentence in Leavenworth, Kansas, early 1982. He and Lake would correspond via letters during the entirety of his incarceration. Lake would send him, you're not going to be surprised, nude photos of whatever various women and teen girls he'd been able to uh, talk into posing naked for him. He'd also send pictures of a bunker he'd started building once that project began. A fellow Marine incarcerated in Leavenworth with Ing Johnny Carty would later recall Charlie talking about all kinds of crazy shit while he was locked up. He said Charlie wanted to get back to stealing weapons when he got out. He said he wanted to steal missiles and shoot down 747s. He wanted to rob banks, commit mass murder, and quote, kill, kill, kill. He also wanted to bomb a bus station, and he really wanted to sexually torture as many women as possible. Johnny would later say that when it came to ways he could sexually torture someone, Charlie had, quote, a real imagination for it. And Ng told Johnny once he got out, he was going to do what he wanted to do to these women in a bunker torture full of video cameras. Another inmate, Ed Popovich, would also say that Ng confessed to all kinds of dark and crazy shit while he was in Leavenworth. While Charlie settled into prison life, Lake initially moved from place to place, staying in various motels, lodgings with friends, couch surfing, you know, staying with some relatives, made money by committing petty thefts, burglarizing homes, selling some weed. He referred to all these illegal activities as ops. He's just, you know, doing some ops. Started assuming various aliases. He managed to avoid capture. Lake still found time to see cricket from time to time. Also continued to correspond with that uh, young Darlene Davis. In July of 1982, via letters, 36-year-old Lake and now 17-year-old Darlene arranged to meet at Pacific Union College in Napa, California. They meet, have a whole bunch of sex, renew their vows of affection to one another, and they continue to meet every few weeks or month or so for the next six months until Darlene gets a new boyfriend, and then it stops. Dude had an insatiable sexual appetite. When he wasn't hooking up with Cricket or Darlene, he was hooking up with a variety of old acquaintances around the Bay Area. He was fucking everyone who would fuck him. Through selling weed, he was meeting new girls and trying to seduce and take nude photos of them. He was putting out personal ads and papers to meet and take pictures of more women. He met 26-year-old Rhonda Rayleigh that way when she answered an ad placed under the alias of Tom that Lake had placed asking for an 18-year-old woman to accompany him to Hawaii for a fun, romantic week. This ad's kind of weird to me. Strange that A, someone would put out an ad looking for a vacation fuck buddy, and B, that someone would respond to that ad. It just feels different from like a hookup app because like with a hookup situation, you know, you meet at some, you know, uh, neutral place. And then if you don't like them, you, you can leave and go back with your life. You're not stuck with them on vacation. It feels like a big gamble. Uh, commenting years later about it, Rhonda recalled that Leonard, you know, often talked about s and uh, that she once allowed him to tie her to the bed and spank her. Uh, he, of course, showed her his collection of nude and semi-nude photos and persuaded her to take some nude photos as well. De- he definitely took a camera on the trip. I mean, what, what, what was he supposed to do? Not try to fill up another album of nude photos? What, he supposed to not live his life? When they got back from Hawaii, he and Rhonda and Cricket had some three ways. November 30th, 1982, Cricket and Lake get a divorce. Not because they're really having, uh, oh, a lot of marital problems. It was just for financial reasons. Cricket uh, didn't want to be legally tied to Lake, but she did want to continue to see him. And she would continue to see him and fuck him for the rest of his life. Sometime around Christmas 1982, Lake showed up at his mom's house in San Francisco and shocked the family by wanting to reconcile with Donnie. Right? He's been telling everybody that Donnie's a worthless piece of shit he wants to kill for years. Now, if this seems fishy that he would suddenly want to reconcile with Donnie, it's because it is. Lake suggested that his brother Donnie accompany him on a trip up north to fill a job opening as a house sitter that doesn't exist. And Donnie is pumped. He's overjoyed that his big bro has finally taken an interest in him and not wanted to kill him anymore. And he eagerly accepts. And then, surprise, no one ever sees Donnie again. So, a little suspicious. His remains will never turn up, but I think it's fairly obvious, you know, that he was killed. Uh, That's pretty cold-blooded shit. You know, he kills his little brother. Just a few days later, a man looking a lot like Leonard Lake, like exactly like Leonard Lake, shows up at the Vantage Social Club in San Francisco. This brothel introduces himself as Donald Lake and presents Donald Lake's driver's license. Leonard Lake had told several people over the years that he wished his brother was dead, that his brother was worthless, and he wasn't fucking kidding. And killing his bro didn't seem to shake him up one bit. After he uses freshly dead Donnie's ID to get a membership at the Vantage Club, he takes nude photos of several of the escorts working there. Classic Lake! There's no time to be sad, not with so many nude pics to be taken. On January 1st, 1983, Lake makes the first entry in a daily, first entry in a daily journal that he would keep for the next two years. 
He also rents a basement room on 19th Avenue in San Francisco in this house occupied by several tenants. Four days later, he, revisits, uh, he visits his sister to pick up some of his stuff he'd stored uh, with her. Tells her that Donnie's doing great at his house sitting job that doesn't exist. He writes of grabbing lunch at 18th and Mission, sells some weed to some prostitutes, and talks about getting a blowjob. For the next several weeks, journal entries are filled with mentions of selling dope, taking nude pics, you know, banging this person, banging that person. Uh, he also writes to seeing his mom a lot, helping her work on the home, borrowing a car, dropping by to spend time with her. Uh, he does not write about anyone seeming to be the least bit worried that Donnie hasn't contacted anyone. No one seems to give a shit about Donnie. In addition to having taken Donnie's ID, he also begins to cash Donnie's disability checks from the government. What a, what a great bro. We should all be so lucky. In early February, just after a month, uh, you know, uh, staying in his basement room after trying to fuck all of his female roommates, which I'm not just making up. He wrote about it in a journal about, you know, he tried to feel each of them out that if he could sleep with them or at least take nude pics of them. And they said no. So he's like, fuck this place then. Well, you guys don't want to fuck me and take, let me take nude pics. All right. Okay. All right. I guess I'll just leave then. You know, being a creepy, rapey, murdery fuck living in the city. You know, it was fun, I guess, for a little while. But it's not, you know, building a bunker, soundproof fuck dungeon out in the woods fun. So what's the point of staying there? February 19th, Lake watches The Collector again, records it. He writes, ah, The Collector. Has it really been nearly 20 years that I've carried this fantasy? And Miranda, how fitting. My lovely little prisoner of the future. I suppose in my way, I am the same wimp as the hero. And in my way, just as crazy. I have no doubt that we wimps have been compensating for our inability since the dawn of history. Sad, really. Still, how can we die if we never live? He's just, he's a maniac. You know, whatever that means. Love that he sees himself as like this victim, this wimp. No, you're just a lazy piece of shit who has plenty of sex, way more sex than average, but it's not enough because you're just delusional. Uh, he's thinking about Operation Miranda a lot. Cricket's father owns a remote out-of-the-way cabin near Wilseyville, about three hours from San Francisco, 70 miles east of Sacramento in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And he starts taking a lot of trips to this cabin to scope it out as a possible, you know, Operation Miranda bunker site in early 1983. Um, that's, let's say, uh, oh man, I got the wrong date here written. Oh, there we go. Okay, I wrote 1980, uh, yeah, two, just for a second. And I was like, wait a minute, where are we? We're 1983. March 30th, 1983, Leonard writes some especially creepy shit in his journal. He writes, once I had a wife, she was my connection to the world. Through her, I could love, trust, believe in things others are allowed to believe in. I could have died for her, killed for her, even gone to jail, given up my freedom in exchange for the security of her love. Once I had a wife. Now I have no ties to the world. I am both above it and removed from it. Oh, there are those I love, my sisters, even cricket still. But none of these bind me to the order of existence. I am free to die with no responsibility. All I love, I love alone. Freedom. An empty privilege, but still one I must bear with determination. Amusing. Our land of the free is not prepared to deal effectively with a truly free man. That's because most uh, truly free men don't want to just, you know, fucking torture and rape and kill people. What can they do to one who carries cyanide pills in his pockets? Ha. Had to get cyanide in there. When death holds no fears, when there are no responsibilities beyond the next meal, society... You are being socked and you don't understand by who or why. And if you did, you are powerless against one who is not afraid to die. Ah, I don't know about powerless, you know. You can always kill the person who isn't afraid to die. And then you do have some power, you know, because they're fucking dead and you don't have to deal with their crazy ass anymore. Dude has no conscience willing to die for his beliefs and his beliefs are centered around sexually abusing women. He's a monster. He's a monster who knew he was a monster. April 1983, Leonard decides to murder a man he'd been in regular contact with off and on for over a decade. A man who seems to really have been his, you know, best, most consistent friend after reading a bunch of other stuff about him, Charles Gunner. Uh, you know, him and Charles, they'd stayed at each other's houses. Charles had known both his first wife, Karen, also Cricket. Uh, Leonard was close to Charles' wife, close to Charles' kids. Leonard had even slept uh, with Charles' wife once, of course, and taken some nude pics because, you know, it's Lake. Leonard uh, called the plan to kill the friend he'd had the longest relationship with, Operation Fish. Random details about Charles Gunner. He volunteered uh, as a birthday clown. And was in a in charge of a local troop of birthday clowns. Lake apparently didn't hang around anyone for a very for any length of time who didn't march to the beat of throne drummer. On May 24th, 83, Lake wrote in his journal that the time was right to kill his friend Charles. A friend of Charles, Wendy Open, an, a part-time clown that he was uh, you know, uh, associated with, agreed to watch Charles's kids for a week, and Lake took Charles to Wilseyville to murder him. And that's what he did. Never said how. Just like with his brother Donnie, Charles took a trip with Lake and then was never seen again. When Lake returned without Charles, he told Wendy that Charles had met a younger woman, fell in love, and had just taken off and left with her. 
And that was it for Charles. Oh, and Lake asked Wendy if he could fuck her. Not kidding. Uh, and then he asked if his ex-wife Cricket and he could fuck her, uh, if they could take some nude pics of her. And she said no to all three offers. <laughs> he asked, he asked, it feels like in this story, I was reading, there's this crazy uh, long book about him. It feels like I left so many of them out too. I've talked about it so many times already. There's more to come. It feels like he asked to take nude pictures of every woman he met. All right, sir, are you ready to order? Uh, you bet. Uh, uh, Samantha, uh, Samantha. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd like the moons over my hammy, a side, extra bacon, cherry Coke. And can you pop that top off and show me them titties? I want to take some pics. Come on. Let's have some fun. Uh, everybody after killing Charles Gunner, Lake started driving around his van, collecting his disability payments, loved to collect other dudes, disability payments. Lake also acted as a father figure to Charles's two teen daughters. So weird. The man who killed their dad buys clothes for him. Now cooks for them for a little while. Uh, doesn't even try and take nude pics of them in the summer of 83. Lake thinks that, uh, you know, maybe building his doomsday bunker in a sparsely unpopulated, unincorporated community called Myers Flat in Humboldt County is the way to go. He brings a woman and her two daughters that he just, you know, recently met to the cabin. A cabin he rented there a few times. Uh, shows her, of course, you know, his many, many nude albums. Talks to her about the apocalypse. Talks about taking cyanide. <laughs> and then she leaves. Uh, uh, the sister he wanted to fuck and maybe did fuck Janet visits him finds his albums as well and apparently did not ask him but but where's Donnie where is Donnie he wrote all kinds of creepy shit in his journal uh, writes stuff about uh, in uh, Myers flat about meeting a 12 year old girl uh, that he wanted to take some nude pics of a girl he called jailbait such creep by October he gives up on Humboldt County decides that Cricket's dad plays in Willsieville that's, that's the way to go that's the best place to build an apocalyptic rape dungeon he'd done a lot of you know Com contrast comparisons. He built a pro and con list. You know, he carry the one, crunch some numbers. He's like, nah, nah, nah. No, that's, that's the right place to carry this out. And then Cricket joins him in Calveras County for the first weekend in October. Calveras County, shaped like a giant arrow point, aimed northeast towards Lake Tahoe, 135 miles away over the rugged rugged peaks of the Sierra Nevadas. It's a torturous journey journey. My God, of more than 20 miles to Wilseyville along a twisting two lane road from the closest real town, the unincorporated community of San Andreas. I recognize the name from the San Andreas Fault. Uh, Wilseyville consists of a post office, small general market, cluster of two or three other buildings, about three dozen little homes. The entire area is shaded by towering ponderosa pines, scattering of live oak trees. In the winter, snow often covers the rugged, hilly terrain. Leonard Lake, in order to reach the property belonging to Cricket's dad, has to take a small, windy street called Blue Mountain Road to an unpaved driveway, about 200 yards up the dirt driveway. He pulls into a clearing where the house stands. A one-story rectangular yellow wooden structure topped by a low-angle light green roof stood at the top of a very, very steep slope. On two sides, an expansive redwood deck projects over the hillside. Inside, two bedrooms, one bathroom, and a combo kitchen dining room fills 1,100 square feet. And right after moving in, he puts an ad on a community bulletin board in the little nearby town of West Point, you know, finding out if any uh, local women want their nude pictures taken. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. It's just so ridiculous to me. He just, it's never ends. Uh, and he gets started on his bunker. It's finally time for Operation Miranda. He rents a backhoe to scoop dirt out of the, uh, the slope, only 15 yards from one corner of the house. October 23rd, 1983, Leonard Lake lays out exactly why he wants to do all this, uh, what he and Charles Ng would end up doing uh, to who knows how many young women in Operation Miranda. At home in Wilseyville, this sick fuck puts a video camera on a tripod, hits record, sits down in a well-worn brown recliner, looks into the lens, Spells out exactly what he wants to do. Dressed in a long sleeve, black and white patterned shirt, fader jeans, and brown boots. He clasps his hands in his lap and emotionless, just leans back and starts talking. And says, this tape, which you're hearing now, is going to be the lead-in of the various phases of construction of a building, which hopefully will be the first of a series of underground buildings. And then goes on a bit to describe this public purpose of the above ground portion of the building was to be a tool room and a storage room, a shop basically. And then he speaks about the real reason for its construction, still showing no emotion, he says, the main emphasis of the building, the whole justification for its expense and its effort, will be a hidden portion, a secret room, if we can call it that, that will house a cell, a jail cell, if you will. The purpose of that cell will be the imprisonment of a young lady who probably at this moment is unknown to me. Then the doomsday prepper switches things up to speak about other purposes for building a variety of underground buildings, talking about living in troubled times, intimate ho holocausts, you know, the apocalypse is going to wipe out most of humanity, much like crazy shit. The only survivors, he theorizes, are those possessed, uh, who possess the foresight to build bunkers in the mountains and stock them up with food, weapons, and money. 
His personal bunker, though, he says, will also provide a place to live out his dark sexual fantasies. And this is the real reason he's building all this. He says, for anyone that is interested, anyone who needs my justification, my rationalizations as to why I would want to imprison and, in fact, enslave a woman, they have only to look closely at me. I'm a realist. I'm 38 years old, a bit chubby, not much hair, losing what I have, not particularly attracting to women. All of the traditional magnets, the money, position, power, I don't have. And yet, I'm still very sexually active. And I'm still very much attracted to a particular type of woman who almost by definition is totally uninterested in me. I'm attracted to young women, sometimes even as young as 12, although to be fair, certainly up to 18 to 22 is pretty much ideal range as far as my interests go. I like very slim women, very pretty, of course, petite, small-breasted, long hair. But such a woman, by virtue of her youth, her attractiveness, her, de her desirability to, the majority of mankind simply has better options. There's no particular reason why such a woman would be interested in me, but there's more to it than that. It's difficult to explain my personality in 25 words or less, but I am, in fact, a loner. I enjoy peace. The quiet, the solitude. I enjoy being by myself, and while my relationships with women in the past have been sexually successful, socially, they've been almost always a failure. I've gone through two divorces, innumerable women, 50 to 55, I forget the exact count. Uh, I'm sure he did know the exact count. Let me, look at, let me look at my photos. Let me refer to my photos. Oh, it was, actually, it was uh, 340. And he says, I'm afraid... The bottom line statement is the simple fact that I'm, a, that I'm a sexist slob. I enjoy using women, and of course, women aren't particularly interested in being used. I certainly enjoy sex. I certainly enjoy the dominance of climbing on a woman and using her body. But I'm not particularly interested in the id, the ego, all the things that a man should be interested in to complement a woman's needs. Then he talks about how he can fake non-sexual interest in a woman, you know, for a little while, but that he'd rather not, and it's kind of, you know, a lot of work, and he doesn't care for it, and he says... What I want is an off-the-shelf sex partner. I want to be able to use a woman whenever and however I want. And when I'm tired or satiated or bored or not interested, I simply want to put her away. Lock her up in a little room and get her out of my sight. And that one, that freaks me out, that part, because that is word for word what I said to Lindsay the other night. I was like, listen, <laughs> listen, all right? You, don't, you want me to take out the trash on a regular basis? Well, here's what I want. Let me get out my notes. <laughs> no, you fucking murder me. He says that he confesses such an arrangement is not only blatantly sexist, but highly illegal. There's no doubt about that. It violates all the human rights and blah, 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 blah. That's not my words. That's his. I'm going to spare posterity my concepts of other people's morality. I'm explaining my morality, what I feel, what I want. And as of this moment, I'm going to try to get the advantages of such a situation are, of course, obvious. And even beyond sexual, such a woman, totally enslaved, would be useful for the mundane chores I have to do. But I'm not particularly interested, th but, but, but am not particularly interested in doing. Clean, uh, cleaning the house. Washing, sorry, his grammar's a little fucked up. I have to try and rearrange it. Cleaning the house, washing dishes, etc. A slave. There's no way around it. Primarily a sexual slave, but nonetheless a, physically, a physical slave as well. Still expressionless. Still not showing any emotion, speaking barely above a whisper, Lake says, and I believe that if I can construct a holding cell, a place where I can put such a woman, where I can walk off and feel secure that she can't escape, that I can create a facility that is so stark and so empty, so cold, so quiet, so totally removed from the world, that fairly quickly, by a combination of painful punishments, where I'm displeased, and minor rewards, such as music or magazines or some such stuff, that I can quickly condition, this is my belief, that I can quickly condition a young woman to cooperate with me fully, and in fact, even look forward to cooperating with me, simply for no other reason than such cooperation would be a relief from boredom. Taking a breath, pausing no more than a few seconds, Lake adds, whether I can do this or not will remain to be seen. Obviously, I've never done such a thing before, and it may not work. However, I, I want to try. I, I want to try. Like he, like he says this in a way, in, <laughs> you can find portions of the video online. He says this in a way like, like you're going to be like, oh, I get it. Yeah, no, I, I get it. Okay. I thought it was crazy before, but you know, once he explains it. Uh, then he talks about the cost and logistics of constructing his bunker for a few moments before staring right into the camera and saying, life as I'm living it is boring. The challenge of this project, the excitement, the thrill of it will be an exciting experience even if it fails. As long as I don't get caught, it's very attractive. It's something that I fantasize daily about. We'll, we'll see. I don't think there's much more to say on the subject. I, I can hardly wait. Holy shit. Well, there you go. He doesn't leave anything to the imagination. This is the purest, most honest confession I can remember hearing uh, from any of the dirtbags we've covered on Time Suck. 
Like, why did Lake imprison and then sexually torture women? Because he wanted a sex life. He wanted a slave, pure and simple. He wanted to try and create some kind of Stockholm syndrome situation with some woman, a condition in which hostages develop a psychological alliance with their captor during their captivity instead of hating them. Uh, that term, real quick, by the way, comes from a 1973 bank robbery in Sweden where Jean-Eric Olsen, convict on parole, took four employees of the bank, three women and one man, took them hostage during a failed bank robbery in Stockholm, negotiated the release from prison of his friend, Clark Olofsson, to assist him. They held the hostages captive for six days in one of the bank's vaults, and when the hostages were released, none of them would testify against either captor in court. And actually, they began to raise money for their captor's defense. They liked them. Lake wanted to create his collector version of this. Hold a woman hostage, get her to somehow like him. Now, do what he wants to do sexually, not have to care for her. Uh, man, talk about brutal honesty. Soon after making this tape, Lake writes to get nervous about getting caught. Right? He's, he's not able to continue cashing Charles Gunner's state checks because of some paperwork that he can't fill out. He writes, Operation Fish will terminate soon. Paperwork is arriving I can't comply with. Must start scouting around for suitable replacement. Should have already done this. Two weeks before Christmas, 1983, needing help on the construction project, Lake places an ad in a local newspaper. Randy Stewart, 15 years old, responds, accepts an invitation to the cabin. Lake introduces himself as Charles Gunner and hires him. Randy would later recall that while he worked for Lake, Cricket brought several young girls, age 16, 17, to the cabin so Lake could photograph them, of course. Uh, one time, Lake showed him three videos of girls disrobing, putting on new garments, and Randy realized that the girls didn't know they were being recorded. Each video depicted at least three different women. So at least nine women he sees. Uh, he's you know sneak, sneaking these voyeuristic nude videos of. Uh, to celebrate New Year's Eve 1983, Lake drives to San Francisco to meet a female friend of Crickets and her boyfriend. He later writes, went hot tubbing with them. Later took them to dinner. And then he discusses a new idea, I'm assuming with Cricket, called Operation Scott. So now he wants to kill a new person to keep that disability money run, uh, you know, coming in. By February 1984, the bunker's almost built. With completion in sight, Lake's thoughts turn to his plan to enslave a female victim, which he records in his journal, writing, while well, I enjoy company, I don't want an independent guest or girlfriend around for too long or too often. I enjoy quiet, not having to entertain or clean up after others. People around seem to get in the way, get into things, attempt to change things. When Miranda arrives, she'll be on a strictly helpmate basis. She'll be around when I need help, do what she's told, and go to her room when I'm finished with her. So he's just constantly thinking about this. On a weekend trip to the Bay Area, Lake picks up a tabloid newspaper, scans the personals, makes a telephone call to a gay man named Phil. Phil's wishing to find a partner who enjoys oral sex. He later writes in a journal, went over to his house to case the place. Nothing of immediate grabable, uh, grabable value. So I let him give me head. Surprisingly very good. Slow and deep as I like it. Still strange having a man do it. No reciprocation, of course. With a little work. <laughs> Just write that down. Just in case anybody's reading this. I didn't, I didn't suck his dick. All right? Let's be clear about that. With a little work, I might be able to pass for him, considering a fish-like operation. So not looking good for Phil. He's sucking Lake's dick while Lake is considering killing him and taking his identity. Lake ends up inviting Phil out to his place on March 16th, the day before. Phil cancels the trip. Ah. Lucky call. I wonder if this Phil guy learned about Lake uh, later, realized that if he hadn't canceled, he would have for sure been murdered. Uh, not a lot happens over the next several months. Uh, he shoots a neighbor's dog for barking too much, and then he smooths things over by giving the neighbor some homemade porn. Seriously. Oh, and he convinces the younger sister of the kid working for him, uh, building the bunker, you know, uh, to let him take some pictures of her boobs. So just, just shooting a pet and taking some uh, kitty porn. Slow a couple months for Lake. On June 29th, 1984, Lake's buddy Charles Ng walks out of Fort Leavenworth Disciplinary Barracks 26 months after he had been arrested in Philo. On Monday, July 9th, after hooking up with a lady he'd corresponded with while in prison and not killing her, he visits the guy he'd been locked up with in Chicago and then flies out to San Francisco where Cricket picks him up. Right before Ng arrives, Lake rents an apartment in San Francisco in the same building where he'd lived a year earlier, 19th Avenue, near Golden Gate Park. Uh, I referred to it as a house earlier. I knew that that, that that was something I should have corrected my notes. It's actually this huge apartment building that was called the Pink Palace. It would later be converted into a senior housing uh, facility uh, shortly after uh, all of this happens, like in the next couple of years. Uh, so Ng helps with moving in chores at this new apartment. And it's important this building is not just totally random. A lot of the victims end up uh, being other people who live in this building. Uh, the two men converse about old times. They catch up, you know, talk about Ng's prison experiences, uh, discuss all the nasty shit they want to do to people. Uh, Lake then takes a two-month break from his journal writing. Uh, writing, he did this because uh, he needed to allow a period of time to pass that was best left unrecorded. 
So a lot of bad shit, uh, I'm sure, happened in the summer of 84. Following Ng's arrival in San Francisco, there would be a sudden spike in home invasions, burglaries, unsolved murders in the area. That was probably not coincidental. Uh, Ng also quickly is able to get a driver's license and social security guard uh, under the name of Mike Komodo. No one knows how this fucker was able to just easily get fake identification information all the time. Uh, a woman saw a man who looked exactly like Charles Ng leaving the apartment of a man who was murdered on July 25th this summer, uh, dragging what she assumed later to be a body. Two other men had been killed near Lake and Ng's apartments a few days before. Investigators would later believe these murders and robberies probably had something to do with, uh, you know, with Ng and Lake. Lake, going by the name of Alan Draynow, starts asking a lot of Pink Palace residents to come to the mountains with him. If they're women, he'll ask them to come for a nude photo shoot. If they're men, he asks them to come check out some weed he's growing that they can, you know, deal and make some money on. 37-year-old Pink Palace resident Maurice Rock goes with Lake to pick some marijuana to sell that summer. Never seen again. Pink Palace uh, resident Cheryl Okoro approached by Lake to take some nude photos. Never seen again. Local Randy J uh, Jacobson, who lived nearby the Pink Palace, who owned a broken down van that Alan Dre, a.k.a. Lake, wanted to buy, also goes missing. His girlfriend, uh, uh, Maisha McLennan, later recalled that Alan, a.k.a. Lake, came to Randy's house to talk to him about buying the van. She had to hurry off to school, left the two of them alone. Last time she or anyone else would ever see Randy again, and the van disappeared after that. A few days later, she received a letter in the mail from Randy, suspiciously saying that he'd left to head off to San Jose with some guy named Steve he just met to help with some big pot operation that she had never heard about. The letter was not written in Randy's handwriting, didn't mention when, if ever, he'd come back to San Francisco. She found that a little suspicious. Then after he was gone for a full week, she checked his bank account, saw that a disability check of his had recently been cashed, and so she figured, I guess maybe it was his handwriting. I guess he was okay, which he wasn't. He was dead. Lake was cashing his checks now, you know, uh, next to trying to take nude photos of every woman he met, trying to kill and cash the disability checks of everyone he knew who was receiving disability checks was his favorite thing to do. Shortly after arriving back in San Francisco, Ng rents a place a half mile from Lake's apartment on Lenox Way that he most likely paid for with money he'd taken from people he'd killed. On September 28th, to keep from arousing too much suspicion, Charles Ng gets a straight job at Dennis Moving Company located on California Street. Takes under his real name. This month, Lake also begins to record entries in his journal again. He writes, I have learned that my programming in my youth, that which is called morality, either was not given or was given poorly. To all purposes save a few, I have no morality. Accept it as fact. In terms of life and death, neither seems to move me. Okay, so he's figured out he's a complete sociopath uh, who isn't bothered, you know, by killing his brother, close friends or strangers. And he also, uh, you know, this is uh, his grandparents and, and mom's fault and his dad's fault. You know, he just wasn't given the, the proper training to be a decent person. Uh, the, he says, the past two months saw Miranda come to fruit. That taught me more. The perfect woman is one who is totally controlled. A woman who does exactly what she's told and nothing else. There are no sexual problems with a totally submissive woman. There are no frustrations. There is only pleasure and contentment. I have observed, I believe, one woman who found this not only acceptable, but even desirable. I highly doubt that's true. He writes, I doubt this will be the norm. And in, and in this case, the woman's low mentality probably affected the discovery. A whore, druggie, and fool. Still, I enjoyed using her, and seemingly she enjoyed the use. I do hope I do better next time, however. Pink Palace helped with money and sex. Not sure who this woman is he's referring to. Uh, sadly, numerous Ng and Lake murder victims will never be identified. Ng gets busted for shoplifting in Daly City in October of 1984. Dude been stealing shit since he was a kid. Not about to stop now. Lake writes a journal about being annoyed with Charles after having to bail him out. On Halloween, Lake writes about finding a new person to kill and make some money off of. He writes about seeing an ad in uh, the San Francisco, uh, another little like, you know, kind of a weekly uh, named for, for uh, an, the ad was placed by a guy named Paul Cosner who wanted to sell his car. There we go. Lake writes about the man looking enough like him to be able to use his ID. And a few days later, Lake meets up with Paul to talk about buying the car. And guess what? No one will ever see Paul again. On the evening of November 9th, Lake, Meek, uh, <laughs> Lake makes Jesus uh, the last entries in the journal that had covered a little more than two years. He types, and so life goes on up here. On alternate days, it has rained and I've done nothing. He mentioned the possible arrival of another woman he'd met. He writes, she may come up this weekend. If she does come, I expect to screw her. Why else would a woman uh, over 40 
Traveled 100 miles to visit a man she doesn't know if she doesn't want to be screwed. Been playing with the vid equipment. Walking the dog. General stuff. As ever, reading a lot. Tonight, I retyped all my written journal notes. End here. All right. Uh, there will be no more record of Leonard Lake's daily life after this, but some videotapes will be made that will confirm his completion of Operation Miranda. Then the week of November 9th, Lake and Ng make a stop at the post office in Pioneer, a little burg a few miles above Willseyville, rent two post office boxes. Um, Lake uses the name and identification documents of Randy Jacobson. Ng claims to be Michael Komodo, and then they use these addresses to correspond with future victims. On January 18th, 1985, Charles Ng's moving company coworker Cliff uh, Parento will disappear forever. Two letters will show up supposedly from Cliff at the company a few weeks later. They're both postmarked from Willsieville. Uh Well, I guess, you know, like this little Pioneer. But that, yeah, they, they come from Pioneer, we imagine, but the Willsieville, they get a little stamp on them. So from the, the area where they have their Armageddon bunker. Uh, one is made out to Cliff uh, and Ng's boss, and it says, Dennis, sorry to leave on such short notice, but a new job, place to live, and a honey. Came all at once. This is their standard kind of letter. Ah, got a great job and met a lady out of nowhere, and I just got to fucking abandon my entire life and never see anybody again. And then it says, please send my check for the last three days uh, and my W-2 to my new address below. Thanks, Cliff. And then the new address is the Pioneer Post Office, uh, post office box. It's crazy how many people disappeared around these two dudes. And investigators don't have a clue they're killing people yet. On February 1st, Lake and Ng get some new neighbors in Willsieville, young San Diego couple, Lonnie Bond and Brenda O'Connor with their baby, little Lonnie Jr., move into a cabin near Willsieville. They quickly meet the neighbor who lived down the slope from them, a man who introduced himself as Charles Gunner. Says he's a professional photographer. Uh-huh, the photos, he never stops, he never stops. Lonnie and Brenda's friend, Scott Stapley and Tori Doolin drive up to the cabin in mid-February to help their friends settle in. When Stapley and his girlfriend return to San Diego, he shows pictures of, uh, you know, the area to his coworker, uh, Terry Kohler, who've been a close friend for nearly six years. And uh, Terry's like, man, this guy, something, something bothers me about this guy. And she points to Charles Gunner. And he's like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, this guy's a total creep. Something very off about him. They were very right. Something was very off about Leonard Lake. Also, uh, in February, a local San Francisco musician in a band called Crash and Burn, Jeff Gerald, starts working with Charles Ng at the Dennis Moving Company. He'd worked there before Ng worked there. And uh, Ng's boss, Dennis, let Jeff have seniority over Ng. And Charles doesn't care about this. You're for this. He just doesn't appreciate it. He complains to Dennis. Dennis doesn't do anything about it. And then on February 24th, Jeff meets Charlie to go help somebody move and disappears and is never seen again. On February 25th, Leonard Lake visits a doctor about 20 miles from Willsieville. One of his fingers on his left hand had been shot. Prior to showing up unannounced at the doctor's office, Lake had called his sister Janet and uh, at close to 11 o'clock p.m. Saturday night, tells her he's been shot in the hand. Since she had experience as a nurse, he wanted advice on how to treat it. Janet gave him instructions on cleaning and bandaging the wound. Then he shows up at her door early the next morning after a three-hour drive and asks her to give him treatment. He tells her he picked up a man who wanted to buy some weed, and the dude tried to burn him. Struggle ensued. The guy's gun discharged, and it sent a bullet into a finger in his left hand. And Janet, you know, helps him with the wound. Uh, what she doesn't do is ask where the fuck Donnie is. I don't even think anyone filed a missing persons report on this guy. Uh, so this guy who shot Lake, probably Jeff Gerald, the second Charles Ng coworker to go missing in a month's time in April of 1985, or it could have been somebody else. I mean, we, we don't know exactly how many people they killed. April of 1985, Lake and Ng find the first known Operation Miranda victim, 18 year old Kathleen Elizabeth Allen. Kathleen was doing great before she ran into Lake and Ng. She was young, smart, hardworking, kind, beautiful, excited for the future. She had a full-time job at Safeway the grocery store in nearby Melpitas, where she worked for most of a year. You know, prior to this happening, her boyfriend, Michael Sean Carroll, 23, worked at a pizza restaurant. The two recently had rented a motel room together to stay in until they could find a more permanent residence. Then on fi Friday, April 12th, Mike doesn't come home. She's worried sick. By Sunday, April 14th, Kathy is very worried about her boyfriend. She struggles through her work duties at Safeway, trying not to think about where Scott could be. And then she gets a disturbing phone call, a call that sends her fears about Mike skyrocketing through the roof. Someone called her, undoubtedly the someone, Lake or Ng, saying that Mike had experienced some serious problems in San Francisco, had sought refuge near Lake Tahoe, Lake Tahoe, uh, about 140 miles away. The person on the phone asked Kathy to head to Tahoe and meet him. They said they would send someone to pick her up at the supermarket. A coworker at Safeway would later say that Kathy told him Mike had been shot and might be dead. That same Sunday evening, Kathy called a friend, James Bio, 
and told him that a strange man had arrived to pick her up and take her to Mike, and that this guy constantly talked about wanting to take nude pictures of her. Clearly, this is Lake. Clearly, this is Lake. James asked Kathy to call when she arrives at the destination. Kathy promises she will, and then he never hears from her again. And no one ever sees her again. Uh, a few hours later, Kathy finds herself in a terrifying set of circumstances, unable to call anyone in the outside world. A uh, video camera is recording segments of her nightmarish predicament. As the tiny red light of the camcorder blinked, Kathy is sitting in a well-worn brown fabric recliner chair, her legs crossed, wearing a white jersey with red short sleeves, dark pants, and black shoes. Handcuffs bind her wrists together behind her back. Sitting still with a numb expression on her face, she says nothing. And from behind the camera, the voice of Leonard Lake fills the room. Mike owes us. He can't pay. Now we're going to give you a choice, Kathy. And this is probably the last choice that we're going to give you. You can go along with us. You can cooperate. You can do everything we tell you to do willingly. And in approximately 30 days, if you want a date to write in your calendar, the 15th of May, we will either drug you blindfold you or in some way or other make sure you don't know where you are and where you're going and take you back to the city and let you go and what you say at that time i don't care my name you don't know his name is charlie but screw it and at that point charles uh you know ing emerges from the shadows in the dimly lit room dressed in dark colors lake wearing a tan knit sweater enters uh, the camera range now for a moment to adjust the bonds on kathy's ankles then moves back out of sight and says if you don't cooperate with us if you don't agree this evening, right now, to cooperate with us, we'll probably put a round through your head and take you out and bury you in the same area we buried Mike. A few minutes later, Lake tells Kathy, while you're here, we'll keep you busy. You'll wash for us, you'll clean for us, cook for us, you'll fuck for us. That's your choice in a nutshell. All this stuff will be played later for a jury, and people were especially bothered by this video. Makes sense. A few minutes later, he adds, in the last 24 hours, we've been tired, nervous, a little high strung, perhaps. We expect you to do something about that. Believe me, we both need it. If you go along with us, cooperate with us, we'll be as nice as we can to you. Well, you know, we'll be as nice as we can to you within the limits of keeping you prisoner. If you don't go along with us, we'll probably take you into the bed, tie you down, rape you, shoot you, and bury you. Sorry, lady, time's up. Make your choice. Fuck! These motherfuckers are ruthless. Then Lake instructs Kathy to take off all her clothes, tells her that Charlie is going to shower with her, and then when she's cleaned up, they're both going to have their way with her. Back at her Safeway, Kathy's store manager receives an unexpected call from Kathy on Monday. Kathy asks for an extended leave of four weeks. Right? They have her convinced they're going to let her go in a month. Explaining that she has a prospective job lined up in the Lake Tahoe area, the manager grants her request. Subsequently, he receives a typed letter under... Uh, which appears to be her signature, announcing that both she and her boyfriend, Mike Carroll, had found permanent jobs. They'll be staying in their new location. It also contains a request for the manager to clean out her locker, forward the contents along with her W-2 form to the post office box, right, near Wilseyville, California. Two more tapes of Kathy will later be found in the second tape. She also gives, uh, she gives Ing a massage. In the third tape, Lake takes some nude photos of her. After that, no one knows what happened to Kathy because Charlie never confessed. And Lake never had the opportunity to confess in court. Lake calls a friend the week after Kathy's abduction and has him pick up Mike Carroll's car, saying it was abandoned, and has him sell it. Meanwhile, in early April of 1985, Lake's new neighbors are growing increasingly frustrated with the man they know as Charles Gunner. When Lonnie Bond conducts some out-of-town out business, Lake stops by his house and asks his wife, Brenda, to... Can you, can you fill in the blank? To take some nude pics. You got it. Classic Lake. You just got a Lake, Brenda. Uh, Curtis Everett, Lonnie's pal and business associate, stays overnight at the cabin. Bond tells him he's trying, uh, this is another night. Uh, Bond tells him he's trying to stay clear of Gunner because Gunner is a survivalist who has weapons, deals weed. Bond tells Everett that he'd been to Gunner's house, seen all sorts of guns, grenades, even a fucking grenade launcher. <laughs> Bond also noticed uh, shelves in Gunner's house jammed with videotapes and he'd heard he was into making smut movies. And Gunner, Everett later said, had the hots for Brenda and continually, continually bothered her about modeling for him. Sounds right. She'd been so unnerved by the insistent and constant, you know, uh, request for her to pose nude that she got, uh, she grew afraid to stay home alone. And then in mid-April, Bond and Everett meet in a valley town to work on some commercial, you know, enterprise while Brenda and Lonnie Jr. stay with acquaintances in San Diego. And Bond tells Everett that he'd had enough of Gunner's shit. He told them that as soon as their business was done in the valley, he was going to take care of the problems in Wilsonville with a gun. Everett would later say that he interpreted the comment to mean that Bond planned to have it out with Gunner and pay him back for messing with his woman. He was going to go kill him. 
and he would have it out with Lake. And he and a friend, uh, you know, uh, that came to deal with Lake, Scott Stapley, they would lose this battle. By Wednesday morning, April 17th, he and his baby Lonnie Jr. and his friend Scott would be dead and his wife would either be dead or about to die. Being held captive, a new playmate for Lake and Ng's Miranda Project. Lake and Ng, after the murders, drove to San Diego, showed up at Scott's girlfriend, uh, Tori Doolin's home. Lake told her he wanted all of Scott's belongings to take back with him to make it look like Scott had moved out so that nobody came looking for him. Lake said he tried to cover up the deaths of Scott, Lonnie, Brenda, and Lonnie Jr. at Wilsonville because it looked like there was illegal guns and drugs in the cabin, and he didn't want the police snooping around. He said it looked like the, the, the whole scene had been a drug deal gone bad. Completely overwhelmed with shock, Tori actually gave him all of Scott's stuff and didn't contact authorities. Dude was a smooth-talking psychopath. In Michigan, the families of Brenda O'Connor and Lonnie Bond couldn't believe it when phone calls and letters from their loved ones suddenly just ceased without explanation. Several other families had recently felt the same horror when their kin had vanished. Donald Lake, Charles Gunner, Maurice Rock, Cheryl Okoro, Randy J Jacobson, Harvey Dubbs, Deborah Dubbs, Sean Dubbs, Paul Cosner, Clifford Pertineau, Jeffrey Gerald, Mike Carroll, Kathleen Allen, Lonnie Bond, Brenda O'Connor, Lonnie Bond Jr., two babies, four women, ten men, God knows how many others all missing. All having been in contact with Leonard Lake or Charles Ng or both right before they vanished. If you don't remember those Dubs' name, a woman had seen Charles Ng leaving the San Francisco residence of the Dubs family, baby Sean only 16 months old in July of 84, shortly before the family vanished, along with a lot of Harvey Dubs video equipment. He'd recently opened up a business called Video Dubs to either record weddings, graduations, etc., or rent out expensive video equipment for others to record these events, and it's believed that Ng and Lake killed this entire family just to be able to have their video equipment to use for the Miranda Project. By early May 1985, there had been so many victims that Lake could transfer money from one victim to another for his personal use. Using Randy Jacobson's identification, he cashed a check to Randy that appeared to have been written by Kathleen Allen from her credit union account weeks after both were dead. On Sunday, June 2nd, 1985, Lake and Ng's long run of murder and mayhem would finally come to an end. They wanted some materials to torture people with, so Ng and Lake drove to a South San Francisco lumberyard supply store you know, slash supply store, uh, at the corner of Railroad Avenue and Spruce Street. It wasn't a particularly chilly day, but Ing wore a heavy parka, perfect for concealing shoplifted items. Leaving a Honda in the store's front parking lot, Lake and Ing stroll inside. Ing stops to examine a display of table vices. God knows what he wanted to do with some vices. Lake wandered off to another section of the store. Reserve South San Francisco Police Department Officer John Callis happened to enter the store a few minutes later, watches a short, muscular Asian man walking towards him carrying a large vice. Fully expecting him to turn left towards the sales counter, Callis is surprised when he instead marches quickly out the front door. Instantly, Callis approaches the sales clerk, asked if he'd sold the man a vice. When the clerk said he didn't, Callis said, well, if no one sold a vice, then you just got ripped off. Accompanied by another clerk, Callis sprints outside of the parking lot to find Ng. He spots him standing at the passenger door of a copper-colored Honda Prelude, about 75 feet from the entrance. When Callis spots him, Ng moves away, walks diagonally towards the intersection of Spruce and Airport. The clerk shouted at him to stop. Ng picks up his pace, vanishes from sight. Callis, meanwhile, returns to the Honda, looking for the vice, sees a box of wrenches on the back seat. Callis called in the crime. Officer Daniel Wright comes to the store. Since the Honda's trunk lid remained open, Wright looks inside, finds the vice still marked with a $75 price tag. He later recalled, there was a South City Lumber and Supply bag directly next to it. I looked through that for any type of receipt, but found none. Callis wondered aloud if any more property might be in this car, any more stolen property. So Wright scanned through the trunk's contents, and he later reported, I found a backpack, lifted it, and it was very heavy. Inside was a gun case containing a semi-automatic Sturm Ruger 22 caliber handgun and a silencer. Examining the weapon closer, Callis noted a serial number, found that the weapon had been recently purchased by R. Scott Stapley in San Diego, one of the murder victims, right? The guy that was going to go help his buddy confront Charles Gunner, a.k.a. Leonard Lake. Wright had just completed logging this information when a bearded man exited the store, approached him, said that, hey, everything's all right. He said he'd taken care of the bill for the vice. You know, his friend accidentally had carried it out. There's no reason to pursue this matter further. When Officer Wright asked him who he was, Lake says, my name is Stapley. And then he reaches for his bill for a bill reaches for his wallet and withdraws a driver's license for Robin Scott Stapley. Wright, once again, uses his radio to check for any warrants on Stapley, picking up the silencer 
Wright uh, told, you know, Stapley that it was an illegal possession, places him under arrest, handcuffs him, radios a request for another officer to transport him to the station. While Lake is being taken in, Wright finds a stun gun and also finds nine slide photographs of Lonnie Bond, Brenda O'Connor, Lonnie Bond Jr. and others. Lake had taken pictures of a lot of these, uh, these people before killing them. You know, made them into slide photos so he so he could, I'm guessing, you know, watch them whenever he wanted to relive his kills. Photo albums of nude women he'd slept with or at least, you know, talked into taking some pictures and pictures of people he'd murdered. His collections. He really was the collector. Like Bob Berdella in Kansas City, uh, you know, a much darker collector than the character in the book or the movie The Collector. I wonder how many people he showed nude photos of murder victims to. I bet he got off on shit like that. Officer Wright called in for another check, this time on the vehicle. He learned the vehicle belonged to another missing person, Paul Cosner of San Francisco. At the police station, the bearded man calling himself Scott Stapley faces some serious questions now. In an interrogation room, an officer spoke to Lake, tells him uh, how they knew his Honda belonged to a man named Paul Cosner, who had been missing for nine months, tells him that someone had attached license plates registered to a Buick owned by Lonnie Bond, another missing person, so they had him. They fucking had him. He knows it. Lake slumps in his chair, defeated. His eyes well up with tears. He asks for a piece of paper and a pen saying he needs to write a note to his wife. You know, his ex-wife, really, before giving his confession. His interrogator removes his handcuffs, his handcuffs so Lake can do so. While Lake scrawls a message, he asks, for, asks, uh, he asks for a glass of water. He's given one. He admits that his real name is Leonard Thomas Lake. Tells the police he's wanted on outstanding charges in Mendocino County. He also identifies his companion as Charles Ng, adding that Ng had, ser had served time in Levensworth. Then he writes his note, which says, Dear Lynn, and Lynn is cricket, I love you. I forgive you. Freedom is better than all else. Tell Janet I'm sorry. Mom, Patty, and all, I'm sorry for all the trouble. Love, Leonard. Lake then folds the paper, stuffs it in his shirt pockets. Before the handcuffs can be snapped back on his wrist, he reaches under his collar, pulls out one of those fucking cyanide pills he's been talking about for years that he would never shut the fuck up about, gulps it down with a quick swallow of water. Moments later, he has collapsed on the floor. He's, you know, he's starting to have convulsions. He had did it, or he had done it, excuse me. He said for years he was going to take cyanide to avoid prison time, and he wasn't joking. Right before he loses consciousness, He's able to talk one of his interrogators, uh, this female detective, into taking off her top and posing for a couple of quick nude pics. Uh, of course, that's not true. <laughs> I would love it if it was. He's like, uh, help me. Help me. If you could just, if you could hand me the, if you could hand me the camera, if you could just, just, just a nip. If you could just take off your top and show me a nip. Uh, he's rushed to a nearby hospital, puts on life support systems. He, he, he'll never regain consciousness. Detectives quickly contact Lynn Cricket Balaz, who leads them to the cabin and the bunker in Wilseyville. And investigators immediately get a search warrant to look over the premises. Investigators soon, soon step inside Lake's combination tool shed workshop. They find an array of construction tools, as expected, along with shovels, picks, a wheelbarrow, other ordinary uh, you know, implements and tools. Uh, they also find a wall covered in photos of scantily clad young women, not all of whom seem happy to be uh, having their picture taken. Detectives know they, have, they are now facing the task of identifying a variety of murder victims. By facing or by pacing the perimeter outside, the investigators realize there is considerably more space inside than what's being used by the workshop. They re-enter the building, see piano hinges on a plywood wall, realize there's a hidden door behind some shelves. The hinges are bent as if someone on the other side had been pushing or pounding on the concealed door. That's so fucking sad, right? Whoever's been trapped inside there, pounding, trying to get out, perhaps a variety of people pounding, trying to get out. Would the officers open the door they find it leads through a narrow passageway into a rectangular chamber that they will label the living area. The room contains a bed, table with a lamp, desk, dresser, shelves for food storage, clothing, various other supplies, and also, how psychotic is this, a copy of The Collector by John Fowles resting on the bookshelf. It's the only book on the shelf. If captives wanted to read, that's what they got to read. At one end of the chamber, a plywood partition divides the space, making yet a third tiny room, no more than three and a half feet wide by six and a half feet long. It contains a narrow platform, about two feet wide. Uh, a rubber foam pad lays on this platform that was probably used for a bed. Five-gallon plastic bucket with a roll of toilet paper sits in a dark corner. The cell had been completely soundproofed. A mirror had been inserted into the wooden wall between the living area and the tiny cell, providing a one-way view into the cramped cubicle so someone could watch whoever was inside. A single type sheet of paper was posted on one wall. 
The words made the detectives sick. When they read it, it said, rules. One, I must always be ready to service my master. I must be clean, brushed, made up with my cell neat. Two, I must never speak unless spoken to. Unless in bed, I must never look my master in the eye, but must keep my eyes downcast. Jesus Christ. Three, I must never show my disrespect, either verbally or silent. I must never cross my arms or legs in front of my body or clench my fists. And unless eating, must always, this is so weird, must always keep my lips parted. Four, I must be obedient completely and in all things. I must obey immediately and without question or comment. Five, I must always be quiet when locked in my cell. Six, I must remember and obey any additional rules told to me. I must understand that any disobedience, any pain, trouble, or annoyance caused by me to my master will be grounds for punishment. So fucking ridiculous. And again, and again, weird that this is, I don't know what the odds of this would be. It's got to be like one in a trillion. This is exactly uh, word for word what I read to my wife, Lindsay, again, just the other night. I was like, we got to talk about some fucking ground rules. All right. Listen, <laughs> listen we're going we're gonna to negotiate from here. We're going to start here and then we're going to fucking, and we're going to compromise. No, this is crazy. Uh, that he actually did all this shit. Investigators find photos, so many photos. They find videotapes of two women, Kathy Allen, Brenda O'Connor, who knows how many other women were actually, you know, held hostage there. In the opening shots of Brenda's tape, she sits in the same brown chair Kathy had. Uh, at one point, she says to the man who she still thinks is named Charles Gunner, right? This guy that she thinks is her neighbor, Charles. Charles, what are you going to do? What? what are you going to do to us? Why are you doing this? And Lake answers, because we hate you. A minute or so later, Lake says, your baby is going to take to be taken away. There's a family in Fresno that doesn't have a baby. Brenda pleads, you're not taking my baby from me. Uh, incredibly, some of these videos, like this portion I watch on YouTube, Lake says, they've got one now. Charles adds, it's better than uh, the baby is dead, right? Lake and Ing then taunt Brenda about her baby. They make her undress, tell her that Charles is going to shower with her and that Lake is going to then rape her. Brenda has no idea that as this tape is made, her baby and her husband are already dead. As the land around the bunker begins to be searched, six different plots of ground containing blackened soil that signals the sites of hot fires where remains may have been burned or found. One of the police canines ma makes the first discovery that sets off alarms of multiple murders. The curious dog walked a short distance away during a break in the search, returns carrying a bone between his teeth. Close examination reveals remnants of flesh still clinging to the bone, and then a pathologist declares that's a human bone. Not long after this, not far from the bunker in a secret chamber, a sheriff's deputy spots a four by eight foot section of plywood on the ground, partially obscured by a scattering of iron rich red dirt common to the region. By sifting the dirt removed from under the plywood, the searchers turn up bone fragments, a section of a human spine and bits of human teeth. Dr. Boyd Stevens, chief medical examiner for the city and county of San Francisco, joins the task force, reports that hundreds of bone fragments have found uh, that have been subjected to cremation. The reason for six burn sites on the ground becomes clear. Bodies definitely being burned in these six sites. Eventually, thousands of bone pieces are gathered from the property. On the third day of the search at Wilseyville, investigators receive expected news from San Francisco that Leonard Thomas Lake has died from cyanide poisoning. His death will be the first on a long list of deaths. The next two entries come from a uh, grisly discovery by men excavating a telephone line trench. The first body, probably an African-American man, never be identified. The other victim, also African-American, was Maurice Rock, one of those guys who disappeared from the Pink Palace. Remnants of another occupant of the Pink Palace, Pink Palace are found, Rock's friend Cheryl Okoro. Also among the photographs discovered in the bunker is a picture of Okoro standing on the deck that projected from the back of the Bala's uh, cabin, her wrists locked in handcuffs. Several sealed packages containing hundreds of dollars in coins of all denominations are dug up on the property. Two Tupperware containers uh, have uh, rolls of silver dollars in them, along with valuable gold pieces, foreign coins, and jewelry. One of the plastic paint tubs held Leonard Lake's journal from 1983 and 1984. Several more sealed drums contain driver's licenses, social security cards, bank cards, checkbooks, other ID. Randy Jacobson's remains are found, that man who'd vanished from the Pink Palace or near the Pink Palace in June of 1984. The medical examiner finds that his body was totally encased in lime and that he had ingested cyanide, Leonard Lake's poison of choice. Two more videotapes are found. When an investigator popped one of them labeled taboo into a VCR, it, it at first appeared to be nothing more than a taped movie. 
But when he rewound it, a split second flash of something obviously unrelated to the movie appeared in the first few seconds of the tape. Two stiff bodies wrapped in plastic and in seeping or in sleeping bags, seemingly in rigor mortis, appeared to be resting in a blue wheelbarrow. Copeland had seen a blue wheelbarrow near the bunker. So what else had been on that tape before that a, mov a movie was taped over it? A snuff film, right? Did they uh, not find snuff films because maybe they were sold on the black market? I I'd be surprised if he didn't make them. No more bodies turned up. Experts estimated that after finding some 45 pounds of bone fragments, at least 25 people's remains were buried around the bunker. Now, what about Charlie Ng? Let's back up a bit. Find out where he went when he walked away from that lumber yard. Back on June 2nd, 1985, after he simply walked away to avoid arrest, he contacted Cricket from a payphone. She picked him up. They drove back to the lumber yard. When they saw Leonard talking to the cops, Cricket got scared and drove off. And she dropped Ng off at a bus station where he called his aunt told her he wanted to take a vacation and was able to get her to wire him 400 bucks. He called the owner of Dennis Moving, said that a pal in Hawaii had committed suicide, said he needed time off for the funeral, packs a suitcase, then has his aunt drive him, uh, uh, yeah, drive him to San Francisco International Airport. I'm sorry. Uh, I meant to correct that my notes too. She didn't wire him. Little detail, but important. Get these things right. Uh, she gives him the money. Does not wire the money. Gives it to him. En route to the airport, he mails a package of guns to himself in Chicago buys a ticket to Chicago, flies there, stays at a friend's house for a few days. Former Marine he spent time with in Leavenworth, receives that package that he'd mailed. Uh, Ng then spends four more nights at the Chateau Hotel in Chicago under the name of Mike Komodo before getting a ride to Detroit where he crosses the border into Canada. From there, uh, he makes his way um, to Calgary where one of his sisters lives. By the week, first week of July, 1985, Charles Ng has been targeted, targeted in an international manhunt by FBI, Interpol, Scotland Yard, uh, the Royal Canadian Mount of Police. He makes it to Calgary, where it is not believed he, st uh, he believed that he stayed with his sister. Maybe he was just too worried that agents were monitoring her house. Instead, he hides in the woods. He fashions himself a primitive lean-to campsite in Fish Creek Park, situated in a small wooded valley that runs through the southern part of Calgary, short walk from a bus stop. Some kids find him sleeping there in the woods. The police are called. Uh, Ing is gone by the time they make it back to the park, or they make it to the park, the police. Then on Saturday, July 6th, old Sticky Fingers gets caught again. Sean Patrick Doyle, 46-year-old high school teacher, part-time security guard, nudges his partner, George Forster, 48, inside a downtown Hudson Bay Company department store. Doyle has spotted a short Asian man wearing a T-shirt, blue jeans, and running shoes, acting suspiciously. He, uh, he says Ng put a tin of salmon into a shopping bag along with a two-liter bottle of Pepsi, canned soup, sugar, some other items. Then he slips several of these items into a blue knapsack, walked past the cash register, and heads towards the exit. Doyle and Forster follow him. Once he's a few steps outside the store, uh, Doyle and Forster grab Ng and the struggle breaks out. Ng had a 22 caliber handgun inside his jacket, fires it twice during the struggle to subdue Ng. Forster reported, as soon as I saw he had a gun, I put a chokehold on him. Sean grabbed for his hand, gave him a sort of a shoulder block, and the three of us went down to the floor. Doyle ended up getting shot in the hand, uh, but he and Forster are able to hold on to martial arts master Ng until the Calgary police arrive and take him into custody. Uh, random funny detail about this. When the, the police came and got him, uh, a crowd had gathered to watch, and they erupted into uh, cheers. Uh, the Calgary Stampede was in town, this huge kind of rodeo event, and there was like shows going on around town, and the spectators admitted later they thought this was an act. They thought this was like just a, like a weird little scene, just part of the Calgary Stampede. But in reality, it was this fucking serial killer being arrested for shoplifting. Uh, Ng is booked on charges of attempted murder, robbery, and possession of a firearm. He's taken to the city jail, strip searched. In his holding cell, Ng, who had literally shit his pants on the ride to jail, tried to hang himself with his shit-soiled underwear. I'm sure that was fun for officers to untie, right? They had to, they had to untie his shit-stained underwear, take him to the shower to get clean. For a time, Ng was left naked in his cell, quote, depressed, suicidal, and fearful. The kidnapper became the prisoner. I'm sure he didn't like it. When Ng's campsite at Fish Creek Park is searched, a 35 millimeter camera, serial number 50225954 is found. They trace that number uh, and find out it was a camera that had been bought by murder victim Robin Scott Stapley from a San Diego repair shop the previous April. Ng's real identity soon discovered. American investigators fly to Cal Calgary. Talk Ng they talk to Ng, who lies his ass off, blames everything on Leonard Lake. Ng did make a horrifying assertion about captive Brenda's baby, Lonnie Bond Jr. Lake said, uh, 
or Ng said that Lake had strangled the child by, quote, putting the baby's head between his thighs and twisting the upper body. Jesus Christ. Ng said this execution method was his idea, saying he told Lake, if you want to kill the baby, make sure it doesn't suffer. <sighs> Detectives questioned Ng about all the crimes they were uncovering in Wilseyville and also crimes unrelated to Lake such as a young woman who had been shot to death in Hawaii at a car rental agency on a military base. Ng became a suspect in that case, also in a rape case in December of 81. On December 18th, 1985, Ng is found not guilty of attempted murder in Canada. He is found guilty of assault and robbery, sentenced to four and a half years behind bars. Nearly three years later, October 1988, Ng faces the opening stages of court hearings to determine the issue of his extradition to the U.S., where murder charges have been filed against him. He'd spent, the previous two, or he'd spent the previous two years studying for his defense, hoping to avoid being sent across the border. Right? There, was a, there was a possibility he would not be sent to the U.S. because Canada does not have a death penalty. California does technically have a death penalty. And it was Canada's you know, choice to, uh, you know, to either send him or not. And there was a chance they wouldn't because that was against you know, uh, their morality to send somebody to an another country that does have the death penalty. So during a trial to decide his extradition fate, U.S. investigators tracked down one of the men Ng uh, spent time with in Leavenworth, Ed Popovich, uh, one of the guys he talked to about all the horrible things he did to try to persuade Canadian officials like, this guy is really a piece of shit. You really want to send him to us. You do not want to release him. And then Popovich tells you know investigators that he and Ng talked about all kinds of crazy shit, uh, talked about stuff like using lime to dispose of bodies. You know, bodies in Wilseyville were encased in lime. He said, we also once discussed the best way to burn bodies. Ng told him that he and Lake had killed several people. One time after he said he shot a guy several times, he said they'd burned his body. There were just teeth and bones left. Ng said that he and Lake had tortured that guy and other men before killing them. He also supposedly told Popovich that he and Lake had killed some women. And then uh, one time they even killed a woman's baby. He told Popovich he targeted a coworker to kill, which he did. Ng supposedly said that Lake preferred not to do the killing, so he did a lot of them. Instead, he, uh, you know, did all kinds of things that checked out with what investigators were finding in Wilseyville. You know, that they'd burned some bodies, buried others around the bunker. Ng told Ed uh, that he'd tortured and sexually abused a variety of women. Popovich said that Ng admitted to using a knife on one of the female victims and quoted Ng as saying, I cut the bitch up. I chopped her up. Regarding another victim, quote, he said he had used a concrete reinforcing rod. I believe that meant he had beaten her with it. He said he used pliers on one, on her nipples. Jesus. Popovich believed Ng had videotaped torturing these women, but the footage was never found. Popovich said to investigators, Ng told me he had anal intercourse with some of the women, as well as sexual intercourse and oral copulation. He said he always wasted them, quote, afterwards. He said Lake participated with him in this. They were together and had videotaped some of these activities and would send me a tape. He said the last call he received from Ng was in mid-April 1985 when Ng invited him to come out and join in on the fun. So Popovich, clearly a piece of shit as well, Ed said that he told him he couldn't afford to come out and Ng offered to send him some money, but he never did, and then he never heard from Ng again. On September 26, 1991, seven Canadian Supreme Court justices announced that by a slim 43 margin, so he almost got away with all this, they ruled that Charles Ng could be extradited to California and face a trial that might, that might result in a verdict of death. Think about how crazy that is. That's a four to three margin. You reverse that, then he gets let out and he goes home to Hong Kong and just fucking does whatever he wants to afterwards. Uh, a few hours after this verdict, Charles Ng enters a cell within the, cold, within the cold foreboding walls of Folsom Prison, a few miles east of California's capital, Sacramento. For Charles Ng, the years of studying legal procedures while locked up in Canada had armed him with an arsenal of knowledge he would use to wage an all-out war on the California justice system. A jail guard would later claim he overheard Ng say, if you want to delay the system, all you have to do is fire your lawyers. And it was a tactic he would use generously. It would take six more long years of legal wrangling, changing judges, changing defense attorneys, motions, complaints, venue arguments, and other delays before Charles Ng would even face a jury to decide his fate. The case would eventually cost California taxpayers an estimated $20 million. What a huge waste of money. Once the trial finally was underway, it quickly became clear that Cricket was involved in Operation Miranda. She signed a plea deal where charges would not be brought against her in exchange for testifying. She was given immunity. After being given immunity, Cricket tells police that she and Lake had conversed on subjects like, you know, cutting up Gunner with a chainsaw. Uh, she also engaged in forgeries of government checks payable to the children of Charles Gunner after his murder, uh, helped sell stolen items with Lake uh, while he was posing as Gunner at flea markets. She also helped the police find one of the bodies. She told police to look under the chicken coop, and that's where victim Randy Jacobson was found. 
One of Ng's defense attorneys would note Cricket was deeply involved in their sadomasochistic sexual practices. Uh, her petition in the Miranda Project was is clear. Jurors were told Cricket had helped recruit potential female victims to be photographed and that many of those photo sessions would lead to murders. On one of the videotapes, Leonard and Cricket even sit together and look at a photo album of young women talking about some of them disappearing, joking about the Miranda Project. Ng's trial lasts from October 26, 1998 to February 8, 1999. And the jury announces that they've deadlocked on one count of murder, but they do find Ng guilty of 11 other counts. So that's fantastic. Sad that Cricket isn't also in prison, but good that, uh, you know, he's found guilty. And then on Wednesday, June 30th, 1999, Ng is finally sentenced. While Ng sat slump-shouldered a blank expression on his face, Judge Jack Ryan cleared his throat and said in a resounding, strong voice, Charles Cheetah Ng, it is the judgment and sentence of this court for 11 counts of murder for which the jury found you guilty and the finding of true in the special circumstance of multiple murder and the jury's verdict of death. It is the order of the court that you be punished by death within the walls of San Quentin prison at a time to be set by this court in the manner prescribed by law. And he has been on death row ever since and likely uh, will just, you know, die of natural causes on death row because California has not executed a prisoner since 2006. In fact, on July 16, 2014, federal judge Cormac J. Carney of the U.S. District Court ruled that California's death penalty system is unconstitutional because it is, quote, arbitrary and plagued with delay. And that takes us out of one hell of a time suck timeline. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. What a tale, right? My God, two sociopaths coming together to unleash so much hell upon the earth. Too bad those Canadian police didn't let Ng kill himself with those shit-stained underwear back in Calgary. Letting him die would have saved well over $20 million. I'd like to think about, uh, you know, uh, I'd look the other way in a situation like that. Just, whoops, I can't believe he killed himself. In five minutes, we weren't watching. No, what a shame. The case of Charles Ng, man, is is pointed to by a lot of pro-death penalty advocates. I, I pointed at it. In that regard, in my stand-up special, Don't Wake the Bear, a few years ago, I called him Robert Ng that day. On the day of the recording, instead of Charles Ng, and I've regretted it ever since. So embarrassing. Uh, I won't go on and on about the death penalty today. I've talked plenty about it on Many Sucks before. Nothing to really wrap up here, man. Just a, a darkly interesting tale. Hopefully hopefully, I told it uh, correctly. There were so many details. Sometimes it's really hard. Some weeks we have a hell of a time finding enough information to kind of build out a suck on some random dirtbag. There, there was one source that we leaned on heavily. I'll have it in the show notes that just had so many details. This, uh, this journalist did an amazing job of putting this all together uh, many years ago. But man, just, uh, yeah, just two dark dudes, very committed to a fucked up goal. Guys who just didn't care about anything other than their own desires, devoted their lives to inflict pain and suffering, to feeling sexually satisfied no matter what that cost other people. Ng still in prison, still in San Quentin, the oldest prison in California, just over 20 miles north of Golden Gate Bridge, so close to where he caused so much of that pain. He's 59 years old. He's healthy. And again, despite technically being on death row, he'll never be executed. So that's a bummer. Ho- hopefully another inmate carries out that death sentence. I hope it hurts. I mean, if anyone deserves a terrible death, uh, right? Who, who qualifies more? He ties with some previous dirtbags we've talked about, like Joseph Duncan. Right? Leonard Lake's old murder buddy, Charles Zing. Right, right up there. Right up there with the, the worst meat sack you can be. And time now for top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Leonard Lake and Charles Ng, both U.S. Marines, both discharged. Ng kicked out and in prison for stealing weapons, fleeing capture. Lake let go for mentally breaking down during a second tour of Vietnam. Both would use their military training to conduct a variety of fucked up ops like Operation Miranda. Number two, Ng was convicted of 11 murders, but he and Lake are thought to have killed uh, at least 25 people. And at least two women were imprisoned and then killed in Operation Miranda. Probably much more than that. Number three, holy shit, Leonard Lake liked to take a nude pic. My God, did he love it. He was more committed to putting together photo albums uh, of nude women than, than anyone I've ever heard of. If he could have just been hired by a hustler or some other porn mag, you know, maybe uh, uh, some of this could have been avoided. Number four, Charles Ng arrested in Calgary in 1985, extradited to the U.S. 1991, finally convicted of murder in 1999. His $20 million trial was the most expensive trial in the history of California at the time. Number five, 
new info, Bob Berdella and Leonard Lake, not the only serial killers inspired by the collector. Christopher Bernard Wilder, a.k.a. the Beauty Queen Killer, was an Australian man from Sydney who abducted and raped at least 12 women, killed at least eight of them during a, a six-week cross-country crime spree in the U.S. in early 1984. He'd lure women, mostly models, to his truck under the pretense of taking some photos, right? Fucking so similar uh, to Leonard Lake. Then he'd abduct them, rape them, sometimes kill them. A copy of the novel The Collector found amongst his possessions, a well-read copy. After his death. What is it about that book? Its author, John Fowles, stated in an interview that his own sick fantasies were what inspired him to write this book. As a boy, he said he frequently imagined imprisoning some women and exerting power over them. Man, if he only knew how powerful this book was going to be, I wonder if he would have just maybe kept that fantasy to himself. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Charles Ng and Leonard Lake have been sucked. What a crazy tale. Is anyone else doing something similar somewhere in the world right now? Right? A lot of survivalists living near me in northern Idaho. Any of them hop- harboring some Operation Miranda-like plans? It's scary to think about what we, uh, what we might find someday on remote properties around here. Uh, big thanks to the Time Suck team. Thank you to the all-seeing eyes of the cult for helping the Countess of the Cult, Liz Hernandez, run the Cult of the Curious Facebook group page. Thank you, Liz, for being on top of the Bojangles emails as well, taking good care of our listeners. Uh, check out the Time Suck Discord channel and that Facebook group if you want to have more virtual social interaction right now. Links in the episode description. Discord link in the Time Suck app. Thanks to the Queen of the Suck, Lindsay Cummins, for doing a little bit of everything. Reverend Dr. Paisley, been working hard on some stuff. We'll in, we will unveil later this year. Uh, Bit Elixir app design crew doing beta test after beta test after beta test on an upcoming app-based trivia game. Logan and Kate at Spicy Club running badmagicmerch.com and the socials. And the script keeper, Zach Flannery, uh, doing a little bit of everything uh, recently as well. And thank you to the many time suckers who send gifts to the Suck Dungeon every week. Very lucky to have such awesome fans. Next week, True Crime continues with the Space Lizard voted in topic of Alexander Solonik, the super killer. Alexander, a Russian gangster who escaped impenetrable prisons, murdered rival gang leaders, A mysterious contract killer who may or may not have been in the special forces in the Soviet military may have assassinated high-level NATO officials during the Cold War. A lot of mysteries around this guy. He escaped incarceration numerous times. And if you believe all the legends, he was basically like a real-life fucking Chuck Norris, Steven Seagal type action movie character. A killing machine, a one-man killing crew who did stuff like take on a dozen men in a Russian prison brawl and win. He, uh, He touched untouchable Russian gang leaders, seemed unstoppable, and then he vanished. And if you want to know more, you have to listen next week. And now let's check out today's Time Sucker updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker updates. Steve Walker has some good news to share with us. I like good news. Steve says, so pleased to finally have something to say to the monster cock master to suck. I get it. As a self-proclaimed student of history and super nerd, gotta say that the historically focused sucks on my favorites. Binge the Lincoln assassination, JFK, LBJ. I have other presidents in my saved episodes. Been jumping around, listening to the most recent. I believe I can officially say the suck is my favorite podcast. Yes. Love the accuracy of information with the tomfoolery and your absolute batshit sense of humor. I mean that as a compliment. My young fiance and I just learned that we are pregnant with our first child, currently five and a half weeks, but we figure by the time you read this, if you choose on the suck, that we will have told our family, I'm so excited to announce it to the world, at least to the world of the suck. But with that comes a question. As a parent of two, do you have any advice for us? Oh Lord, master of suckdom, thanks for so many hours of fun and feeding my quest for knowledge. So many yet to have been heard. Much love to you, the family, and all my fellow suckers. Sincerely, new daddy, Steve. Well, congrats, Steve. Uh, Such great news. Hail Nimrod. Uh, My main advice, I'll try to be kind of brief. Be present. Be patient, listen, let your kid know you love them. I've had times when I've been uh, able to take my kids on nice vacations. I've had times when I've worried about the cost of taking them out to dinner. I used to worry about money a lot with my kids, you know. I used to think about just what could I give them financially. But the most important thing truly is free. It's your time. Build memories with them that they can look back on. Memories when you were patient with them, when you listened to them, you know, when you took an interest in what they were doing. When You, you know, you, you can't tell them you love them too much. Be firm with them. Discipline them when they need it. Give them firm boundaries. Don't let them get away with being a tiny, terrible person because then they'll grow up and be a and they'll be a big, terrible person. But also let them know how proud of them you are when they do something great. Positive reinforcement, probably more, much more important than the negative reinforcement and punishment. 
and get him some, <laughs> get him some, get him the fucking speech uh, uh, classes that I probably should have taken as well. Uh, good luck and enjoy every moment you can. I'm thinking about my kids right now. I'm gonna go on a hike with the fam as soon as I'm done recording this episode. Uh, some nice words now from Sweet Sack Billy Mitchell. Billy writes, "Please excuse my poor punctuation and shitty sentence structure and all the other eighth grade English class bullshit." Also, I don't feel bad about this long ass email like a lot of other suckers. I hope I've managed to successfully send you an email as I am the least tech savvy millennial in history. I've listened to you every Monday for about a year and a half and I finally decided to write if this makes it to you. The reason I'm writing you is to keep your chickatillo shame cock half hard by telling you that this podcast is different in a lot of ways. You not only manage to keep us all suckers engaged, but you bring something new to every single suck. I thought to myself today, why do I listen to your podcast so religiously? All I could come up with is the fact that somehow you managed not only to tell an interesting story that I'd never otherwise hear, like Chikatilo Shamecock or Crowley's butt fucking in the desert escapades, but you put an interesting spin on all of it. Your perspective and humor somehow come together in a soup sandwich kind of way that makes your subjects much more interesting. If you don't fuck up pronunciations of words or throw in a cuss word here and there, your podcast would give off that uptight pinky up while you drink kind of vibe. I like that. I like it. You got to do keep rocking. You're, you're good people. Don't change anything you're doing. Uh, I would have never heard of you or Albert Fish if it weren't for my old coworker, Jordan. He's got an interesting way of looking at things, kind of like you. He's responsible for making me a sucker. I couldn't be more thankful for him. And you take the edge of my Mondays off. He worked with me for an alcohol distributor in Reno, Nevada. For the suckers. Oh, yeah, just a pronunciation guy. But if, if you could do me a favor and give him a shout, tell him John is still a C word. It, <laughs> it would be greatly appreciated. Keep rocking that mush mouth. Pray more suckers suffer Cummins Law. Billy. Well, thank you, Billy. It's truly, truly thank you. You put some wind in my sail with that kind of message. I appreciate it thoroughly. Uh, in a bit of, of a mental funk recently, but I'm feeling better now. Feeling better today. So glad you like the stories the way I tell them because I can't tell them any other way. Uh, and thank you, Jordan. Uh, fuck that cunt, John. And hail Nimrod. Now a serious update from rightfully concerned sucker Nick. I'll leave his last name out for reasons you'll understand here in a second. Nick writes, Dear Dan Cum, Suck Lord, Actual Grandmaster Suck Dragon. First off, thank you for everything you do. Time Suck Team and you have become an integral part of my daily routine. Coffee, nicotine, Dan Cum, mmm, delicious trio. I'm writing this because I'm genuinely seeking your opinion on a serious matter. My daughter, who is three, has accused a family member, an older kid, of touching her inappropriately and making sure to include the fact that it hurt her physically. That is fucking tragic. She has given very descriptive details on when and where and who. When I heard this from her, I broke down like a baby. Did I get it? Not just for my daughter, but for the other child involved, because I personally believe that it is not something that just randomly pops into a kid's head. It's something learned. When I brought this to my family, knowing it would cause strife amongst my family and extended family, my daughter, my wife, and I were immediately dismissed, pretty much told it didn't happen, and that my daughter is lying. It's not good. My daughter maintains that it happened in a closet similar to the one she has in her room when she's brought into that closet to get her nighttime diaper off, to put big girl underwear on, she freaks out. She will scream and say things like, no, please don't touch my holes. Don't touch my pee-pee. Jesus Christ, man. Personally, this is all the info I need to believe her. I'm aware of false memories, how leading questions can create a false narrative. So my wife and I are very careful about that. The accused is not in the same developmental stage as my daughter, so the curiosity theory is thrown out. All I want is for my family to take this seriously, and they are not. My wife and I have avoided bringing this up to my daughter anymore because it's traumatizing for her, and we want her to forget ASAP. I truly do not know where to go from here. I'm reaching out to you because I respect you as a man and as a father. I'm not looking for this to be read aloud during a podcast. I just want the advice of another father. Thank you and the Time Suck team for everything you do. Cult of the Curious, truly a wonderful community. I'm so thankful to have this outlet for advice and support. And then I'm going to leave out the last little part there. Well, I chose to read this because I, I, I think it's an important thing for other people to hear, truly. Because sexual abuse is way too common. It's way too real. Thank you first for writing all the kind words. You sound like a fantastic father. This is, this is tough. I thought a lot about your situation. Here's what I think. I think, I think you should do some Googling in your area for a counselor that specializes in sexual abuse, make an appointment for you and your wife to accompany your daughter to, uh, however many, you know, uh, appointments it takes, you know, a good therapist is also going to be well aware of false memory syndrome. And if after, you know, a variety of counseling sessions, you all are convinced that another child in the family, you know, are still convinced that another child in the family touched your daughter very inappropriately. Then I think you go back to that child's parents demand to talk about it. If they won't talk about it, I think you say that you're going to have to talk to the police. Then you're going to have to get social services involved. And if the threat of doing that doesn't start a conversation, then I think you follow through and you do that. Cause if your family is furious with you after that, that's on them. But 
I say all this, uh, you know, with an asterisk, I'm not qualified in these matters. That's why you should go to a therapist, get the therapist's advice about all of this. This is their area of expertise, not mine. And I would do this very soon. Best of luck. I hope this gets resolved as soon as possible. What I wouldn't do is just nothing from this point forward, right? It's too important. You don't want to risk uh, something happening again because you don't talk to somebody and don't root out what sadly, you know, there could be a pedophile in the family. And if there is, you want to do everything you can to find them. And you don't want your daughter when she's older to look back and think that you didn't do enough. So that, that's my advice, man. Best of luck. Jesus Christ. I'm so sorry that happened. Uh, next up, Devil Boy Proud Papa, kick-ass sucker, has a shout out and writes, greeting suckos. This is Space Lizard Devil Boy. Been a Space Lizard cult member for a while. Love the podcast. This is my first time cont contacting you because I haven't had anything important to say till now. My son Kiefer is the one who introduced you and the suck to me and our family and countless others. He's been listening since the beginning. Has to be one of the first few Space Lizards. His art is on your wall. The piece with the Space Lizard and Bojangles coming out of your head. I know it. I remember getting it. He has been to a bunch of your shows in OC, California, in the Orange County, California. Even got to see you near New Hampshire last year. Mm -hmm, out in Boston. He did a demon voice challenge for you. He's the guy who did the shining twins pose for you in the rec room uh, on Eden Beach. The prom pose at, the loca uh, at that location the year before. By now, you probably know who he is. And to my point, this super fan is one of the greatest people there is. I know I'm biased, but it's true. His birthday is coming up on May 7th. It would be pretty fucking sweet if you could give him a shout out. He's been bugging me to call right into the show. So here it is. Keith Dog. I love you. Uh, <laughs> love you big, little buddy. Happy birthday. Thank you, Dan and crew, for kicking out quality content. Become a constant source of entertainment and discussion from our family or for our family. Keep doing that thing you do. We'll keep listening. Hail Nimrod. And keep on fucking. I, like, I don't know if that was intentional, but I, I hope it was and I like it. Well, thank you, Devil Boy. Happy belated birthday, Keith Dog. Your dad did get this message to me early, by the way. So the late's all on me. Love you, man. I uh, hope you're doing well. Hope to see you again. Still have your art on the Suck Dungeon wall right near my desk. Hail Nimrod, dude. Last up, some humor. A Cummins Law and shout-out update from Magnificent Meat Sack, Ryan Shank. Ryan writes, Dear Master Sucker, Quarantine King, COVID Commander, I'm writing in to share my Cummins Law story. I have a six-month-old son. Been in the hospital since March 9th. Sorry, man. My wife and I have been trading place at the hospital every Sunday and Thursday for the last month so one of us can stay home with our four-year-old. The six-month-old just had open-heart surgery this week. Jesus, man. I'm glad, I'm glad they're doing good, though. While sitting at his bedside, I was listening to the COVID-19 suck with my headphones on. One of his monitors started to uh, alarm, so I got up to check on it. When I stood up quickly, the headphone jack pops unplugged. Right after that, clear as day, loudly, you say, no one likes scabby balls while doing <laughs> I'll do a new Manscaped commercial. I, could, I couldn't see the nurse's job. Uh, I couldn't see the nurse's jaws drop because they were wearing masks, but I did see some wide eyes and heard some muffled laughs. I quickly let back to my laptop to pause the episode, prevent any additional ball talk. Luckily, nurses see and hear far worse, so I'm sure they thought it was funny. Sorry for the long email. Just wanted to thank you for all the hard work you and your team do to provide us with free content. Thank you also to Crime and Sports, Small Town Murder, and the Broham Boys for keeping my mind distracted while this has been going on. Been separated from my wife and sons three or four days a week. Uh, every week for the last month has been hard, especially since I've been furloughed from my job and practicing social distancing. All these nurses and doctors are true heroes, and we're grateful not only for their hard work, but for the great sense of humor they have as well. Uh, be well, good sir, and keep on sucking. Well, thank you, Ryan. Appreciate you sharing this. Hope things pick up for you and your family very, very soon. Uh, love the small town murder. Shout out for James and Jimmy and the Bro On Boys. Oh, man, so good. Great podcasts. Yes, a lot of hero doctors and nurses working right now during a scary time for the medical community. Thank all of you in the medical community for doing what you do and thank all of you for sending these messages and have a great rest of your week. I want to go get to the hike with my, with my kitties. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Have a great week, everybody. Fuck COVID-19. Don't let it drive you crazy enough to build a bunker slash fuck dungeon out in the woods. And you know what? Mostly just keep on sucking. Oh, man, that was a crazy episode. Hey, uh, before I get out of here, um, man, what was I going to say? Uh, is there any way, is there any way, can I take a couple nude pics of you? No. Eh, well. I don't know how he did it.